right, everyone. Welcome back to Dose of Reality. We're here with My Awakening, episode number 75. Today I have with me Mark Sargent. Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you for coming on. Thank you very much for having me, man. Nice to be here. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be a good time. So before we get started, what I just do, I'll tell people the plan, tell them what these type of shows are about, give a shout out, and then we'll get going. Um, so anybody that hasn't seen these interviews, what I like to do is interview other people in these various communities that you know I take part in and stuff that I research and things that I don't. Um, people who I think bring a lot of value to the table. Sometimes it's people with a bigger following than me, like Mark. Sometimes it's people uh, with a smaller following. I, I interviewed Arielle Truthseeker a few weeks ago. She had like... 200 subscribers. So uh, people that I think I find interesting. And uh, what I like to do is rather than, you know, we're not going to have Mark come on and give a typical flat earth interview. Uh, granted, we will talk a lot of flat earth. Uh, we're going to get his, his story from start to finish, uh, kind of chronologically and just going forward how this whole uh, awakening process went. So I think it'll be really interesting for a lot of people here. So we are multi-streaming. If anybody wants to know where we are, we're multi-streaming on YouTube. Rockfin, Twitch, <clears throat> Facebook, and Twitter. My main channel or page on all of them, just search Brian S. Stavely. If you don't know, we do intend on multi-streaming this entire show everywhere. And uh, I'm just going to give a shout out and get started, okay? All right. All right. Over on Facebook, we got David Molini. Uh, we got Steve Finneran. We got Larry Young. Over on Twitch, we have Natalie Renka. Over on Rockfin, where there's 30 people so far, Drummanism, Joe Martinez, Joey Butts, Sam Clint, Flat Earth Cat, Esteban, and then over on YouTube, where there is 120 so far, and we have Glenn from Boston, Mr. Super Sidewinder, we got Jess Palmer, Tommy Tell the Truth, uh, let's see, who else? We have Shari Lives, we have Kim Masters, we have Mark Sargent. We have Barker Landar, Call for Zero, uh, Karen B. Uh, let's see, who else? Ted Summer. Mm, DJ, Stopping Traffic in My Rasta Hat. GA, Jason Starr, New Hampshire Guy, Good Times for All. <clears throat> let's see, who else? TJ Trusty, Rico Tinfoil Sombrero, Mojo Shop, Christopher Fitz, Michael Healy. Mm, Globebusters, not really here. Uh, Christopher Fitz and uh, Three Fingers and Anonymity, Spirit Levels, Rude Dragon, Queen Queen of Swords, and I'm just gonna stop there, guys, because we'll be here all night. So, Mark, let's go all the way back to even before the conspiracy research and the type of stuff we all look in in the last several years or whatever it is. Uh, right. What was it like for you when you were a kid? Like, what were you like in school? Were you social? Were you a nerd? I know you said you were really into computers, and I do want to touch on your video game making career when we get there. Were you, did you sure. already have a computer when you were a child? Is that what you were into? No, no, because, no, dude, I'm old. <laughs> I'm older. So yeah. uh, when, when I was going to school, uh, there weren't even... We, your, face, we, my... your face is invisible. You're invisible again. Damn it. All right. You know what? <laughs> We're just going to turn that light off. That's fine. Um, sorry about the... Being you're so old, dimension. you're already you're already half ghost. Uh, I'm, already, I'm already half in the grave. No, no, when I was in, when I was in school, the, the, the computer program was in its infancy. Yeah. So yeah. we didn't... In fact, I was one of the first people when I went to uh, university, I was one of the first people to even... And it was like my June, sophomore or junior year to, to have a computer at home. Most of us had to use like the word processing lab. So no, no, in high school, no, I was I was very social. Um, uh, I graduated young though, so I was you know. And there's a difference between I, I, I don't want to correct you right off the bat. There's a difference between a nerd, a geek, and a dork. Believe it or not. All right, let's hear you know, it. All right, Clarify. so a nerd is pretty much what you would expect. So if I said uh, 3.14159, there's a bunch of people in chat that would just start rattling off the next 50 digits, right? Okay. That's nerd. You know, the, the, anyone that can sing the entire periodic table with that stupid song is a nerd. Uh, a geek will argue at length 
which is a better trilogy, the original Star Wars or Lord of the Rings, and then oh, follow not that even with. Close. Is that even a conversation? I mean, Star see, Wars. see, you're you're even, you're, yeah, you're you're <laughs> on the geek side of things, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, or, or if you want to go more advanced, who was the better Doctor Who in the last twenty years and why? Okay. Again. So, and then a dork, they're usually the most dangerous of the group. We meaning they have some intellect, but they're the ones that be like, yeah. So I heard I can make plasma by putting a lit candle in a microwave and covering it with a glass, and then they yeah. pr proceed to blow up their microwave. You know, I already knew when you laid out these three options, you were going to fit into the latter of the three. So go ahead. Continue. Well, no, no. I, well, I'm <laughs> I'm a dork to some degree, but I'm also a huge geek. I'm a huge media guy, media guy. So anyway, yeah, I was very, I very, very social in uh, in school. But to give you an, but I was I was handicapped, meaning um, I had to. I graduated so young that I had to go to. I had to bum a ride off somebody for my senior homecoming because I wasn't old enough to drive. Yeah. Which sucked. Yeah. Well, how, and so how, did you, I was, how did you get out so early? So you weren't even 16? Were you 15? I was six. I, I was 16. Uh, I had to take driver's ed the first semester of my senior year. So I did not have, I literally could not, could, did not have my own car till um, the, the back half of my senior year. Yeah. So it yeah. was a short, and actually it was probably good. In in hindsight, it probably saved me a lot of problems because I, I there the excuse was like, look, I'm not old enough to drive, so I can't, I can't. I had to bum rides off people for con constantly, so that helped with the whole social aspect. Did you? Uh, so what did you do right after school? Did you did you go did you go right to work? Did you? Uh... What did you end up school, doing? School, school, or you mean high school or, or college? After high school. Oh, so you did go to college. Yeah, I don't even know. Oh, yeah, so yeah, yeah no, right, I did. I did. You went by the way, I have to, to correct, for, for anyone who's listening to this outside the United States, we're the only people that say college. Everybody else says university. I was corrected by a number of people when I lived up in Canada for a year in that college outside of the United States is like a technical college and university is that. So, you know, even though we have all sorts of different types of colleges outside of the United States, they don't. So, no, I went my, my first year, I went to Washington State and drank my uh, my first year. You know, again, I was I just turned 17 <laughs> going on to college. Oh, my God. And just drank and, and just threw that year out. It was just gone. Yeah. I mean, none of the yeah. transcripts transferred over. It was awful. So, and then I went well, we are, to, uh, we, we, we kind of went forward real fast though. Were your parents pretty strict at all? Or were they kind of loosey goosey? Like when you were going through high school? Um, and we were, we were actually, pr my, my sister and I, we were pretty No, I mean, my sister was a cheerleader and I played basketball and, and yeah. uh, so we were pretty, and we both got decent grades. So there wasn't really much to yell at us about. So cool. as far as strict, but as far as strict goes, well, I couldn't drive. So. You know, yeah. I'd rely on upperclassmen, and so my parents yeah. had to vet them. <laughs> you know, they had to be like, you know, and and but but it was it, it's a small community on the island, so everybody kind of knew each other. So it wasn't so strictness. No, wasn't wasn't that bad. Wasn't that bad at all. I was lucky in that capacity. Okay. Okay. So, all right. So back to the keg party. All oh, right. So yeah. So Washington <laughs> State. Yeah, I made the mistake of of pledging a fraternity right off the bat, and that's just nonstop. I mean, they you got to remember. When you're a fraternity or sorority, they force you into social drinking things at least twice a week, at least twice yeah. a week. And that just, you know, our, the, I'll give you an example. The, the grade point of my pledge class was 1.8. <laughs> we were terrible. We were wow. absolutely terrible. So anyway, um, my, my parents were thrilled with that. And so I left Washington State and, uh, and that was over in Pullman and came closer and went up to um, north of Seattle to a place called Western. And that's where I got into my <laughs> out of the frying pan to the fire. That's that's where I got into my fireworks problem, which was uh, I was a huge fireworks nut. Also part of the dork side of things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, in fact, the, what was the what was the show um, Stranger Things, where the you know the kids back back it, fireworks is a thing for any young kid growing up in like the seventies and eighties. Oh, and 90s. dude, fireworks were cool, man. I, fireworks were cool, yeah. and yeah. once I learned how to make them, you know, with chemicals, I was actually pretty good with chemicals. I I I just by accident figured out I could sell them to the Native American reservations. Mm -hmm. We have there's a lot of them up here. 
<laughs> and make some make some coin. And so that's what I did. Uh, up did you Western. just kind I of mean, figure that out by screwing around with things, or did you like research this and find it like through books or something? Or how did you well, I it? well through the the books for the chemistry part, yes. Uh, but yeah. then. I, what happened was I was making for shows because people, were, the, the rich people that live on the island, they would like just cut me checks because they don't want to light up their own fireworks. You know, we get to a certain age. It's like, yeah, I want to keep my own hands. Let that kid do it. So I would be throwing these, these pretty good fireworks shows. And what happened was I, I made too many one year for the show. It was in the late 80s. And uh, I take a, like grocery bags full of um I was usually making the, the, the loud stuff, you know, the M80s, the M100s, that stuff. You know, big firecrackers. And I took grocery bags of them and I set them on the counter at this Native American place. And I said, hey, can I trade these for like some rockets and some other crap? And, and they said, and they, you know, the guy looks at him, he's going, we'll give you five bucks a piece for these right now. And I had grocery bags full. And wow. all of a sudden, I'm not kidding you, naive kid. I'm going, <laughs> cha-ching. It's like, what? Are you serious? And so I, I went back immediately and I, I told my friends, I go, okay, here's what we're doing next spring. <laughs> and I said, I put the whole thing together and uh, had like 31 people on campus working for me and, you know, doing all, you know, this mass production. It was just insane, the, the amount of stuff we were doing. And uh, flooded the market, flooded the entire Western Washington market to where I collapsed the prices on everything. There was all sorts of inventory I couldn't get rid of. Uh, wow. And then I got I got ratted out by um, one of my employees, a girl of all things. She oh. uh, she she dropped the dime on me to the uh, to the feds. So what did that do as far as uh, <laughs> before we get into the legal section? Did that automatically get you kicked out of school? Were you on school grounds like? Oh uh, well, yeah, we were we were manufacturing on school grounds, so that, that was the end of my academic career, and uh, it was also the end. <laughs> so what 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 happened was, we were it was it was such a great little operation. Again, you could have only got away with this pre nine eleven. In in the late eighties, what I what I did was I I because the minimum wage back then was I think three dollars and twenty cents an hour, right? Yeah. And uh, I and people were complaining. It's like I'm not making any money. I go look. I'll pay you nine bucks an hour, but you can't get paid until I get paid. So you just keep track of your own time cards, and that's the only way. And we were doing things in mass. So I would give like I hired a lot of women because they're good with their hands, and I would say, okay, here's half a mile of fuse and a pair of scissors. I need four inch pieces. Go. You know, yeah. just keep track of this. And so I was, I was spent, God, I spent just weeks and weeks just shuttling stuff around campus. And this one girl, she wanted to work for me and we, but she wanted to work for the whole summer. And she and I kind of had a thing and my girlfriend didn't like her very much. So my girlfriend said, you got to fire her right now. And my girlfriend was Native American. I absolutely needed her for, she was like a big part of the equation because I needed her for the, you know, the introduction to the, the people because I was really white, still am really white. And uh, so this girl, she, I'm not kidding you. You know, guys talk a lot of smack, but if you ever have hear a woman make a threat, like, you know, if you do this, if you fire me, I'm going to drop the dime on you. If you actually hear that, don't just wave it off and say, oh, no, no, you know, it's just, you know, she's just blowing smoke. That's yeah. when she immediate. She immediately called the FBI immediately wow, and dude. they and they ignored her. I heard I heard the story from agents later where what happened was she called him and she goes, there's a guy on campus. He's making fireworks, blah, blah, blah. And they're going, yeah, yeah, whatever. Click. Right. They didn't hang up on her, but they just ignored the call. Because they didn't think it was anywhere near the level of operation that you had going over there, you know, Brown, did they? No, no. It's, well, it's some college girl, right? It's like, you know, she's 19 years old. What does she know, right? And so uh, two weeks later, they, uh, they she, you know, she sees me walking around campus and she gets back on the phone with him, calls him back and says, oh, look. Why is he still walking around campus? I told you guys. What She's actually you? nagging the freaking feds. So what they're like, all right, fine, fine. So they just wrote my name down. That's all they did. I, I, mean, I heard the story, you know, from the, the lead agent later. So fast forward a couple months 
and they were busting, they had busted a guy for making uh, tennis ball bombs. Tennis balls are perfect in terms of symmetry. So you can just drill a hole and fill it full so of powder. So what, what, what are people doing with tennis ball bombs? I mean, is it fun to blow up and look at like fireworks? They try to do damage to, what, what are they nah, doing? No, it's about? mailbox stuff, you know, loud. Okay. It's just all loud. Right. That, that's all yeah. it is. It's stuff, you know, okay. the guys like, it's like, wow, man, that really rocked. So they, uh, they followed the chemical trail down to a company in Colorado and they, they flew out there. And I'm not kidding. It was as straight out of an episode, if you remember the show Columbo, where, yeah. I mean, I'm listening. This just fascinated the chain of events where they're just about to leave. Right. And one of the guy, one of the agents goes, hey, by the way, do you know a guy named Mark Sargent? <laughs> right. <laughs> and then they go, do we? <laughs> and how? And, you know, it's like, yeah, we were going to ship him this big order, like 800 pounds of chemicals. And like, holy crap. And we ignored this girl for all this time. So wow. they, they, they took the order and they shipped it up themselves up to uh, Seattle. And that's when they, they hit me with a little sting operation. And yeah, it was. So it was what, happened, fun. what but, happened from it? Did you have other charges? Did you get it continued without a finding or did you? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I learned a lot about the legal system. So what happened is you get hit again, slap on the wrist back in the day. That's also one of the things I looked in the books. And, you know, you can actually look this stuff up. I mean, I knew what I was probably going to get hit with. So the um, I, I got hit with two charges. One was manufacturing explosives without a license. All right. Mm -hmm. And the other was, believe it or not, conspiracy to manufacture explosives without a license. A lot of people don't know this. The conspiracy, you know, the term, term conspiracy, that, even though it's is not that because used much you just because you got other people involved with. You. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's people don't understand that the, the media is hypocritical where they condemn the word conspiracy. But it's like conspiracy is used every day. In everything's court. a cons everything's a conspiracy. Yeah. So if you rob a bank by yourself, right, you just get with bank robbery. If you rob a bank with two of your friends. You get hit Five. twice. Yeah, yeah wow. you get hit once and as a group. You separate get, you charges. Get, you, you, oh, you separate charges, completely yeah. separate charges. So what happened was, oh, just talk about just dumb freaking luck where um, my public defender was um, uh, was talking to me. And, and it took a year before they indicted. I mean, it wasn't a slam dunk for them. But, you know, it was like, oh, should we do this? You know, should we not do this? And when they indicted, they, um, they said... Uh, uh, okay, well, your your judge is going to be Judge Kuhnhauer, right? And I go, John Kuhnhauer? <laughs> I knew the guy. Five federal judges in the entire northwest of the country, and I, five federal judges, and I know one of them. In fact, he lives, he has a summer cabin not, not three miles from here, right? In fact, I did a 4th of July show that was right down. He, he, hell, he donated to the fund. Right. So, in fact, his his son, small world, his son, one of his, he had three sons. One of them dated my sister. So did so they it make like, you change the, did they change the judge? Yeah. Yeah. We had to change think? judges. It, so yeah. it was me and saying, and I, but it was this weird thing where it's like, uh, do we, do we, do we go forward to this? Like, well, he's either going to just tell, tell you to go away or he's going to make an example out of you for his sons. And it's like, oh, that would suck. So anyway, so we, we, the, the second judge was Josh Rothstein, who I also knew in passing, but that doesn't really make any difference. So I'm fast forward to court, right? I'm sitting there in court with, and this is federal, right? This is not, this is not state federal guys. You know, I got guys behind me with fresh stitches and snakeskin boots, stuff like that, you know, looking, looking pretty, pretty hardcore. And I'm, I'm up there in a, in a new suit and, and they're reading off the charges, but I knew there was going to be, it's your first time. It's a slap on the wrist. I'm not kidding. At the very end, she goes, after reading off this laundry list of charges and chemicals and all this stuff, they seized half a million dollars worth of merchandise and all this crap. She goes, all right. Um, so three years probation and can you pay a fine? Of I don't know a thousand dollars, maybe a hundred <laughs> installments, like a yeah. hundred dollars a hundred dollars a month, maybe. And and I look at her, and I'm and, and it was like I felt guilty. I mean, I knew the man hours. I mean, the tack teams that they used to to, to come in with, to get me. Um, and I said, yeah, you know what, I can do that. Oh, I absolutely. Smile. And and she she hits the gavel and I turn around and I look at the wall of guys behind me right and these guys are not they're going straight to jail right these guys and uh, and they're looking at me like I just pulled off a freaking miracle and uh, it just happened to be the the offense 
Um, now, if you get hit twice for it, then yeah, yeah you'll do a minimum of like five years. Uh, everybody's been telling me for a while now you need to focus your camera a little better. Really? You're blurry. Yeah, you're blurry. Karen tried to tell me a while ago, but I didn't want to interrupt you while you were talking and everybody. How about now? People are saying it. Better? Chat yeah, room? I think better? So. Yeah, I think so. Why was it okay. not on uh, high def on Zoom? I don't know. I mean, sometimes it sometimes it screws it up. Just let me know if it's okay, a focus cool. thing. I can just turn it off and turn it back on. All right. So you got off pretty pretty light on court, but you're uh, yep. you were done done with school. So then what the hell? Yep. The school was done, and then professionally, I was uh, um, going to be potentially limited. So what what do you do at that point? So I had to do community service, obviously. So I did it at the um, the the school district. I grew up in a teacher's lounge because my um, my uh, uh, my mother was a career teacher, and I went to the administration and I said, "Can't." A lot of people don't know this. A lot of people think for community service you have to like pick up garbage or you know do all just crappy jobs. Believe it or not, you could work at a school. That actually counts. The mm -hmm. trick is, can you get in? Will the school allow you to get in? Of course, most of the time they won't. It's like, oh, you stab three people? No, you're not going to be doing community service in the school. But if you do a fireworks thing and half the teachers were there at your shows, mm -hmm. they'd be like, yeah, sure, come on in. So I taught, I was an assistant to the computer lab. Go figure, uh, you know, teaching, teaching kids all, all about computers. Can you give us a time and, frame as far as the year? Because computers, this is kind of... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Idea. So graduated in 85, screwed up um, Washington State in 86, and went to Western in 87, 88, 89. Uh, got busted in 90. The court case was done. The indictment was done, I believe, in 92. And I'm, I'm, I'm getting so this rough, is like just just like three or four years before the internet started to explode. Oh yeah, yeah. The internet was nothing. Dial-up hadn't happened yet. Yeah. And so so there was this weird again the the chain of events. So I had to so I I taught computers at this you know the the computer I was assistant at this computer lab at school, which was great. I mean I was the model community service guy right doing this i mean the the guy the guy that came in to check in on me he's like oh he goes it's so great to actually hang out with you instead of the other people I'm going yeah i know right so uh but i also entered this um this computer pinball tournament so back then this was we this is just as dial up is starting to kick in there was a little company out of tokyo called uh -huh. little wing pinball Mm -hmm. And they wrote a computer pinball software game uh, called Crystal Caliburn, which is sort of a knockoff of the real pinball game Black Knight 2000 from the late 80s, but doesn't really matter. And the publisher was out of Boulder, Colorado, and it was called Starplay. And I remember getting to this, and, and they had this worldwide tournament. It's like, you know, not only could you play the game, right? And I was playing on, it was like, on, I was playing the Apple version. It's like, not only could you play the game and have fun, but you could also... It, you know, send in your high scores to the company and they, 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 po they posted rankings. I go, wow, that sounds really cool. Because I, I, back in the day, back in the, like, the early 80s, I won a couple Pac-Man tournaments and I was pretty good at, at mm -hmm. games in general. I always, always have been. So I played this game and I saw the rankings and I believe like in the first month I was already 25th in the world. And I was going, wow, you know what? I might be able to do some damage here. So I actually, you know, knuckled down and, and really tried to focus. And I started climbing, climbing the ladder. And then I realized it's like the, the tournament lasted the entire year. This isn't like anything else. I mean, it lasted literally from February all the way until like November. And I'm going, oh, this is going to suck. Because if you know anything about, about video game players, I mean, they're relentless. And you know, it's, like, mm -hmm. it's like, how much sleep am I going to lose? And so I'm thinking, okay, maybe there's a way I can, uh, you know, bend the rules a bit. So I came up with this idea, which was because, you know, this was, again, just as dial up was happening. And I realized when you send in your score, they, they basically you have to, you had to fax it in. And there was, you know, you couldn't email it in. You couldn't scan it. So I had to fax it in. But it was the score was here. And then the encryption number was down below it. I'm going, well, there's no way I'm going to crack that encryption code. No way. But how is it being generated since we're not online? Right. I go, it has to be something local. And it all of a sudden occurred to me that 
it's probably has something to do with time. Meaning the uh, the old remember the old um, uh, date and time on your on your computers, which people changed manually all the time for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what I did was I, I did a quick test and I changed the date and time and I bumped it up an entire um, uh, month and generated that co code and then sent that in eventually when that when that rolled around. So what, what I'm getting at, and, and if you understand or don't understand, is I was because I, what I didn't want to do is I didn't want to waste the scores. Probably wonder mm -hmm. where I'm going with this. So like if you get 900 million points. It could could have, might have taken you three hours to do, and then all of a sudden you get nine hundred twenty million points. We got to throw out that other one. I'm going. I don't want to throw out. These are some. All some of these are really really good games. So I thought, what if there was a way that I could save these scores and send them in, and then I wouldn't have to play anymore. I could just hold the scores in advance, and so that's exactly yeah. what I did. Wow. So I so I set the the month, and I so I get like a billion points, and I say, okay, here's going to be May. This is going to be June, July. And, and then I could play casually. The, you know, I wasn't under the gun. And if I got something that was really, really good, I just kept pushing it farther and farther. So my scores only got better and I didn't have to play all the time. And that's, that's so I basically won the tournament six months before the tournament ended because I had all the <laughs> scores stacked up in front of me. And then I just made sure that I didn't put in that very, very last score until there was no time for anybody else to respond. Sort of like, you remember the old days when you could bid on eBay? And yeah. you got that like that last second bid on eBay. So that's what I did. Yeah. So I turned into like a 1.2 billion thing with two days left in the tournament. And no one had any chance to, 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 to respond to that. And I won. Never told the owners about this, thank God, because that guy was a straight shooter. So, um, the, uh, so part of my prize for winning the tournament, in, in addition to the trophy, was to beta test great prize right beta test the the company from tokyo their their new game and i hated it i, I was going oh my god this thing's way too easy there's too many extra balls the, the, there's i mean graphically it's fine but there's a lot of mechanics that are wrong and i wrote this scathing review and i shot it off to the to the publisher and he sent it to the guy in tokyo and the guy said he's absolutely right he goes maybe you should hire him and, and so that's how you got in the, that's how you got in the, that's uh, how, that's how i got in and so and the, you're, the publisher you're, you're blurry again too if you can man real what blurry is what is wrong with my camera all right let me see if i can you know what how's that let's see if it, if it blurs out after this this should be fine okay. that's natural light that should not screw up anything still good okay yeah okay looks, looks better now okay Okay, so the, the, the guy, um, the, the publisher contacted me and said, hey, how would you like to fly out to Colorado to uh, interview for a job? And I'd never been to Colorado in my life and flew into the old Stapleton Airport in 95 and, uh, it, it, and flew in the middle of a snowstorm. I thought I literally had landed in the wrong airport, thought I'd landed in Alaska. And I uh, talked to him for a while and... We hit it off and he's like, yeah, yeah, come out, get an apartment. And you know, the nineties, you could do this. And, and Boulder was a tech startup town. So yeah. it was really, really great. He was from California and he was a transplant from California and, and uh, everything. He, it was, it was a, it was a great match. And so I went out there and I played video games for a living. That's what I did. And, you know, had a group of hardcore geeks and nerds and dorks that you know we played magic the gathering we played land tournaments and we you know we went out to eat my my um my best friend at the time uh he won the duke nukem tournament uh out in out at e3 in san diego which was fa nice. fantastic he was one of the finest game players in my life so nice i actually so, got yeah. to play in the uh i got to play in the first nintendo world championship um Did the you? regionals for new england i made the regional finals and i got to play like up on the up on the stage with like you know the big movie screen and everything so what they did is they nice. had a, they had a tournament at child world you remember child world the toy store right yeah and you you had to get as many points in tetris as you could in like i forget you know two or three minutes or whatever and i had yeah. was really good at it so i smoked everybody so they gave me uh tournament tickets for the nintendo world championship tournament nice. and when you got there it was like uh this was the very first year they did it they had it was like a consumer electronics show on the floor because Super Mario 2, which we know is really doki doki, but Super Mario 2 wasn't even out yet. And they had Super Mario 3 for you to test on the floor, Ninja Gaiden 2. They had Game Boy for you to test, which wasn't even out yet. All these different things, you know. 
But uh, what, nice. what, what you would do is you would go to this game that was an arcade unit to compete, and you would do Rad Racer for like a course, then it would switch to Tetris for a certain amount of points, and then it would switch to uh, Super Mario for collect a certain amount of coins, and that's how you would compete against people with the time. Uh, like that. Awesome. It was pretty. Yeah, it was pretty cool, man. I used that's to really, really, really into cool. That stuff. Yeah, it was cool. The, I was um, young too. I was like, uh, I was in little league. I know that, so I must have been like eleven, I think, maybe twelve. Oh, you were so. young. Yeah, yeah when like I 85. when I won my thing, I was in my my early twenties. So now be before that, you know, just just as a little interim, while I was playing the tournament, I had to do something, right? I wasn't like playing all day. Uh, I was working as a sous chef at a Greek restaurant, Mediterranean restaurant, mm -hmm. and I did that for uh, you know more or less basically three years so that's what i was kind of doing uh between the time i got hit with the indictment between and the time that the the boulder colorado so i was offered there was this weird choice in my life weird fork in the road where i had the choice of either managing the restaurant a manager managing a small mediterranean restaurant on this island or playing video games for a living yeah, and it's I know it's, it's well it's tough because I actually like the restaurant business. I, I really I, enjoyed it. I, yeah, and on an island, dude. I mean, that's cool. Yeah, I, I took to it. I mean, I it, I did catering and I worked for the food service when I was up in um uh, on campus, so I was it was a natural for me. And so, but honestly, people would have killed me. It's like nobody gets offered to get played video games for a living. And this was back in the day. This is way back before you know the big money and the tournaments and and all that stuff. Oh, but this the big was, money was the big money was right around the corner if you would have stuck with. It, I know, I know. <laughs> but, but by then, but and I and I felt bad because the um. Uh, the company folded because they lost. They got into an argument with the the uh, the Tokyo developer over um, currency exchange. Of all things, the yen was falling against the dollar, and the guy wanted to renegotiate the contract. And my boss, uh, he was a real stickler for rules, real stickler. And he's going, "No, contract's a contract. I don't have to adjust for the yen. He can go, you know, eat it." And the guy took it the wrong way. He's going, well, he's obviously doing something shady. So he uh, he took us to court. And the, the company was squeaky clean. But the legal fees were so high. Because we did it in Denver. That was part of the stipulation. The legal fees that were so high, it bankrupted the company. So wow. uh, that, that was it. So I transitioned over from there. Again, it was Boulder. <sighs> Such a great time. In the mid-90s. Um, no, late 90s at this point. 98, 97 where um to a time and attendance software company which was right down the road and uh time and attendance software which is time clock software and so i went there and traveled around the country teaching blue collar factory workers how to run t electronic time clocks mm -hmm. because and and these it was expensive software and exp expensive equipment and i did that for seven years which was which was great. I got to I got to see more of America. Uh, I got a, a real crash. That was probably an easy. That was probably an easy job for you, right? It it was it was it was a real and it was a fun job. On top of it, it was a young company. Everybody was under the age of thirty. Um, the the software was was um, was was fun to to work with. And I was also I I learned that I was a pretty clever problem solver. Not the fastest in the world. But I could find workarounds for anything, and so when and so my my specialty was going to these companies, and I'd say, okay, you're not going to use ninety percent of this, you're going to use this, 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 and this, and that's what your company's going to use. And then I go to a different company, it's like you guys are going to use this, this, and this, mm -hmm. and and got into it, and and then I ended up doing you know high level support when I got back, and I traveled to places in the country, so many places in the country you'd never ever go to on on vacation. Ever, you know, regular, you know, like Dixon, Illinois, and Blytheville, Arkansas, and you know, yeah. an amusement amusement park company in the bar, back part of Oklahoma, or a, um, a fire truck manufacturing plant in some weird place in Florida. You know, just it's just all these weird, cool things, all blue collar, and uh, I got to do that, and it was a lot of fun. So, so let's uh, let's move it forward to. Uh when you get a little bit older and you get into uh when you start to get into what they would call conspiracies or whatever and the uh 
the maybe the distrust of the media, the distrust of the government, or however it came for you. I'll just give you yeah. my, my example my... real quick. Uh, my example was like for me in 2010, it was kind of just all of a sudden I stumbled upon, I, I, I was just looking for something to watch on 9-11. And at the time, I, I mean, I literally believed the whole thing, you know, um, yeah. never really thought about it too much, but I believed the whole thing. And I stumbled on a movie on Netflix, which, you know, it turns out to be a lot of disinformation after, but it showed a completely different narrative than the media, than the, what the media was telling you, uh, right. you know, talking about uh, bombs going off in the basement before the plane hit and all this. Um, right. You know, although I don't believe all that now, it still made me uh, dive in. So I had like a pretty stark awakening, right? Like all at once. Did you have like a right. gradual thing or did something uh, hit you? What happened? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, we'll have to backtrack a little bit. So when I, uh, I grew up again on a rural island uh, where I am right now, um, near the Canadian border. So I mean, I grew up very sheltered and very, very naive. I didn't know anything about anything. I honestly, I mean, and it, plus it was the 80s. You know, I graduated from high school. You know, the t-shirt might as well have been no clue and no backup plan and who cares <laughs> because it's like what's what's bad gonna happen to me you know you know there was that song that came out uh, future's so bright you gotta wear shades you yeah know, that wasn't you know that was that was one of the anthems of the 80s which was you know there was this line in there it was like 50 thou a year i'll buy a lot of beer and that was pretty much it it was like yeah make some money drink have some fun there's nothing weird happening it's not like the there's anything sinister happening and then i saw jfk in the theater in uh, the early 90s mm -hmm. and i was a big movie fan i was one of those guys that went to the movies i did not wait for my friends to go to movies i never ever waited because i wanted to see i wanted to see all this stuff and i hated the it was like you know it was like oh no let's go see this you know the typical guy crap it's like you know what i'm just once i got my car and a license i just started driving in and seeing films by myself and I saw JFK in the theater by myself in a crowded, you know, jam-packed theater opening weekend. All, most of the time I went opening weekend because I wanted to be with the audience. I wanted to get the feel for what was going on with the audience. And I remember that was one of the few first movies outside of like Platoon from the 80s. You know, Platoon, when I left the theater, no one was happy when they came out of Platoon. No one was happy when they came out of, came out of JFK because it was done so well and the editing was so seamless that people were like, yeah, you know what? Government, man. <laughs> There's, you like know, that, it, it had such an effect on them that even if they didn't really think about it much before, that movie was just like, oh, yeah. so convincing. Yeah, yeah, you, you squinted. You know, they, you were like, what's going on here? Something fishy's going on. And honestly, I did not even think, I did not believe in lies. I did not believe in conspiracies. Until the, I mean, yeah, yeah, I knew about UFOs and Bigfoot and Loch Ness Monster. Those, the, the cliche stuff. But no, but, uh, inside, inside jobs and false flags and... No, like no, or... inside jobs would, didn't, didn't make any sense to me. So, so that was always in the back of my head, but then the internet didn't fire up until later. Remember, we were on dial-up in the 90s. And then um, uh, Loose Change came out. So, oh, so I was working for that, for that time clock software company when 9-11 happened. And, you know, it was one of those things and the jail was, was, was on the same road as ours. So I remember like, we, you know, it's like, all right, everyone, we're gone, we're leaving. So we we're driving past the, the jail and there were armed, you know, huge amounts of security outside the jail because nobody knew, you know, is this a, is this a joint thing? Is everything going to happen everywhere? Mm -hmm. And it's like, why would the jail be an issue? But whatever. So I saw, I remember seeing loose change and I was going, yeah, man. Yeah. This could be, this could be something. And so that was in my head for a while. And then I just started, as the internet got faster and faster, I started going down more and more rabbit holes. Yeah. And looked at, and again, over the next whew, 12, well, ever since 9-11, so 13 years, I went through, and again, I never, I never got married and never had kids. So I had tons and tons of free time on my hands. I went through just about everything you could think of. I have an opinion on, just about every every conspiracy uh, so, imaginable. So, so let's get your uh, let's get you know everybody remember you guys all know my views on some topics might be different than Mark's, but this is about Mark's awakening and you know probably not going to agree on some things on nine eleven or other topics, but that's sure. fine. Uh, what is your take on nine eleven? And like I learned something else too when I woke up to nine eleven. Uh, not yeah. just like my, you know, everybody has a growing process to come to whatever their conclusions are on what they think happened. And none of us really know the whole story, right? right. Um, but I also learned other lessons along the way too. Like I learned, uh, 
you know, I basically learned what controlled opposition and gatekeepers were because of these. There you uh, go. They were basically all infested. So maybe if we could touch all of that, if you could talk about, did this teach you what that was? Because gatekeepers and the idea that somebody would, people would be out there acting like they're speaking truth, but not right, speaking truth. Right, right, right. You don't, I remember because I, I it took me a while, you know, wisdom takes time. Uh, I was a big believer in good writing. I'm a, because I was I absorbed so much media. I, I'm a big believer in as few plot holes as possible. You know, you there's a reason why when you watch a movie and you don't like it, it's like nah, I'm not buying it. I'm turning it off. It's because of the suspension of disbelief. You're not in. You're not invested anymore. And I would treat that with everything. And so when I looked at this, when I when I looked at initially 9/11, I said to myself, Oh my God, this is the worst op ever. This is the worst operation ever. I mean, you know, so many things went wrong. And, um, and and do I believe it was an inside job? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but I thought there were things went went wrong, and I thought it was I thought it was a, a soup sandwich. Yeah. Only as I watched more and more things did I realize the amount of work and time, and different agencies that had to get involved, and all the different things you had to cover. I mean, it's there's there's a thing um, there's an old saying of power, which is never leave anything to chance. So yeah, everything from the video footage, the live news feeds, everything mm -hmm. to you know to the buildings coming down the way they did, and the witnesses on the ground, and make sure they are on camera as soon as possible, which as much information as possible. Even mm -hmm. though the truther community could see right through it, it doesn't matter because ninety nine percent of the other people are going to be like, oh yeah, that guy seems to know what was going on. I'm going to listen to him. Yeah, and. So, but are you, I also so, are you, had... so are, you, are you trying to say the Harley guy isn't legit? <laughs> And, and your, uh, your face is uh, really blurred again. I don't know what happened, but you got up and got back down. And then... I have no Good. idea You're back. So, all right. So, all we right. were just talking about basically planted witnesses. Yeah, yeah. Pl planted witnesses. When you have a witness... Because remember, shock and awe, that goes everywhere. And so, when, when shock and awe is affecting most of the crowd, but all of a sudden you have a guy that's on camera saying, all right, I saw everything. Here's what happened and blah, blah, blah. And he's perfectly calm and he's rattling off information without stuttering and and he's throwing out stuff yeah. that that seems never happened too... it's something that never happened in the history of the world at that point either too right it's not like this right, is right, a right. common thing is he, he came right. to this conclusion of something that's never happened <laughs> right and then you're blaming um and then and, but the more i looked into it like when when uh, outside of the truther community like when the engineers started getting mm -hmm. together because they were throwing the blame they were throwing the engineers under the bus not not just the engineers for the building, but the engineers and gen engineering in general. It's like, oh wow, it's obvious it was was built wrong, and the engineers are like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? That thing was meant to withstand huge impacts, you know, for deliberate reasons because you know it's so tall, and uh, and they were they were really getting into it, and then you started looking in, kind of like when we you know in our community how we have to memorize. You know how fast the earth is spinning how fast you know going around the sun and sideways and yeah all that. you have to you have to we were learning a lot more about um thermal dynamics and temperatures yeah you know, for example you know it's like it's like wait a minute steel melts at what point and jet fuel yeah, burns and at jet what fuel point? jet fuel burns off at like a quarter of the temperature the steel melts like it's ridiculous. yeah and it burns off fast not only that you know it's a flash it's a flash burn i mean there's a reason why you use acetylene oxygen i used to weld back in the day way back in the day which is like, look, you need you need concentrated flame just to burn a little bit of steel, not these things. I mean, we're talking really, really heavy steel beams. And then you start looking into, you know, stuff like, uh, um, you know, the the fact that there was almost no large debris on the ground, how it was just almost vaporized. And then you're going, you know, you're going into that side of things that was late in the game. I mean. Let's put it this way. I was learning things in kind of like in, in Flat Earth when somebody said, oh, yeah, by the way, the, the moon is generating a cold light. And I'm going, whatever, right? Yeah. I've been in Flat Earth for a year and somebody told me that I'm going, no way. When somebody came to me after, after I'd already watched Loose Change for at least a year and somebody said, oh, yeah, by the way, there's no planes. I'm going, yeah. what? Get out. Yeah. And then you start watching that angle. And then the, the more you go into it, you're like, wow. They really covered a lot of different aspects to keep people guessing, and with and they were all overlapping to where yeah I can see how the general public didn't have a chance. They they, yeah, they well, absolutely. I, I always tell people that no planes on nine eleven is really like a whole second awakening for me personally because 
uh, it really implicates the media, and that's why they really don't want you looking at no planes. That's why there's so much gatekeeping right. in 9-11 to keep you away from no planes, and they want to divert you any other way, down any right. other way, except for looking at, at the media fakery. So l- l- let's go a little further, uh, mm-hmm. and I just want to get I just want to get your opinion, because my, my take is, and it has been, you know, and everybody's different, you know, but I did spend, you know, a, a ton of time on it, you know, from 2010 to 2014. As did, as did a lot of people. Um, and I don't just say this because, you know, most of the things we see now happen to be this. But in my opinion, the entire thing was a complete hoax. Do you think there's a possibility that they hoaxed the whole thing? Or are you firm in believing that thousands of people were in there when the towers came down? You know, that's funny you'd mention that because I had heard rumors. And that was one of those lesser stories that, that starts circulating. And, and it made sense to me, which was the rumor got out. You know how when... It all, the, there's an old um, saying, Ben Franklin, and it goes, you want to keep a secret between three people, you kill two of them. Mm-hmm. And that is people, people can't keep secrets, especially when lives are involved. And so what seemed to happen was somebody at higher echelons, you know, because there was a lot of different companies in those buildings. Somebody started saying, all it takes is one company to be like, yeah, dude, you do not want to be there Monday. Trust me on this, right? That's all I'm going to say. Go away. And then all of a sudden that rumor starts filtering to where next thing you know, half the freaking building. There were very, now there's a couple theories on this, I know. One is that there weren't that many people in the building to begin with, or there was a whole bunch of people that just didn't show up to work that day. Because Yeah, well, there was, uh, from everything I've looked into, the, even by the end of the 90s, by like 98, and there were books published, one's by a guy named Eric Darton, you could still check it out, uh, t- yeah. talking about the vacancy of the towers, and they were already down to 20%, and, and it also and, seems and- that they used the uh, 93 bombing to scare any legitimate tenants that maybe wouldn't be on the scam or whatever to stop moving right. out of there, so I don't and I don't, I don't, that-, that that's a fine idea too, no, I, I don't, I don't disagree with that either. Either one yeah. could be completely plausible because I could see it absolutely happening on both sides. Because then you don't have now, to call people and involve all these people and employees that said, hey, we were tipped off not to come into work. And also, like, the reason, in my opinion, why the first yeah. plane, you know, 8.46 a.m., why so early? You know, why not wait another hour or two when there's more people in there? Well, the tourist right. attractions didn't open until 9.30. So any people that might be tourists coming in, you could just turn yeah. them away, blocks away, and say, haven't you seen oh, the yeah. there's a plane in the building? You know? Yeah, the, the timing was perfect, and you wanted that morning sun. That was also a big thing, which is you want you really wanted it to be sunny that morning, because mm-hmm. uh, you wanted the you didn't want any flashes in those windows to be visible. Those sun yeah. the sun was blinding on those windows, and so you, all you saw was some puffs of dust. But most of the time, you saw a sun's reflection. If it, you could not do this this thing at night, could not could not absolutely be done at night different than like the lone gun i I, I think they actually wanted to wait for a very clear day too so there weren't clouds in the sky much for the yeah. reason we talk about nasa not putting fake stars in their photos because people yeah. that really know their shit will be able to determine that it's it, it's it's fabricated people right. will be able to do that with some 9-11 imagery if it didn't match the clouds of the real day you know right right usually when when somebody asks me about that uh i use the uh, the rosie o'donnell line that got her thrown off the air for three years which was, I mean, I could, yeah, we could go into all those different things. And I absolutely believe it. it was abs- oh yeah. It was inside from, from minute one. But oh, of course. when her, her line was, was of course building seven, which is, which is one of the t-shirts, which is like screw building one and two. What happened to building seven? Why the hell did it drop? Most, most Americans. And I've talked to a whole bunch of them. Don't even know it ever happened because yeah. it happened so late that the island had already been evacuated and then all of a sudden you know 50 story building drops but what got me and i was in the right industry at the right time was when that british reporter you know this as well as anybody the british journalist the the woman mm-hmm. who was reporting that it fell and it's still burning behind her she jade, reported jade tw- stanley jade stanley yeah, i remember yeah, yeah she reported it 20 minutes before it fell and the reason she did it is because she got they got the time zone screwed up Meaning they were with the British team when they got over there, you know, because they flew over there pretty quick. They got over there and they were handed a thing. Read this at this certain time. Well, everybody in America screws up the time zones. Everybody. In fact, most people don't even know America has four time zones. They think there's like three. It's like there's Pacific, there's Central, and there's there's Eastern. It's like no, there's Mountain too, technically. Yeah. But it's America. So instead of reading it 40 minutes after it happened, she read it 20 minutes before it happened. And that's you know, just completely botched the whole the whole thing up. But that was the the question. No one can answer it. 
which is like, look, you know, there's a little fire in the basement that wasn't hit by a plane, and then it just drops on its own. That's that was the the the, the big deciding thing for me. It was like, look, no one else can talk about this. In fact, when you bring it up to most people, they, they get they get angry when you bring uh, up Building Seven. I mean, they just... whew, I learned quick. I, the first thing I did when I uh, took that dive into nine eleven was call my father. Have him come over. It's <laughs> after I got looked into some things and had some playlists ready. I had him come over and sit down for a few hours. Oh, that was the yeah. worst mistake I ever made. I mean, yep. uh, and he's he's been a cop his whole life. He just retired, but at that time he was a cop already for like fifteen years, twenty years, whatever it was. Um, yeah. And you know, I always thought he was intelligent. Uh, apparently not. We sat there and watched. Um, you know, we watched uh, that World Trade Center movie with Nicolas Cage. That's the one I saw. And I think we might Oh, the one that was Bruce. directed by Oliver Stone? That's the one that I saw that woke me up, is uh, that with the firefighters trapped in the elevator. I don't know if Oliver Stone directed it, but the one with Nicolas Cage I'll in it, to, yeah. I'll have to look it up. Maybe, maybe it was. Somebody, somebody in chat mentioned that. So any, Go ahead. anyways, I, 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 they, you know, they're showing uh, firefighters trapped in an elevator because bombs went off before the plane hit. That's the story in, in the motion picture. And I, I says to my dad after we watch, um, well, that was the motion picture that woke me up. But then I actually showed him footage that correlated with that, like 9-11 footage, which I do think, right. you know, is, sta is stage footage. But whether it was staged or not, at the time, I believed it was real footage from credible people on the ground with cameras, right. filming firefighters and all that. And they would talk about explosions and how they were in the lobby before the plane hit. The same stuff you would see in the motion picture. And right. I says to my dad after, so what do you think about that? You know, all these firefighters are saying these bombs are going on. And he said, oh, well, that was just the uh, buildings collapsing and the staircases twisting. And I, t yeah. I was like, you don't think that firefighters know the difference between a collapsing staircase and explosions? And he said, right. we, can't talk, we can't talk about this anymore. And he left. And, uh, you know, yeah. what happened is we barely talked, Mark. And then Sandy Hook happened uh, two years Oof. after that point. And, yeah. uh, you know, I was the day of, I was out there debunking it and I was very vocal, uh, you know, cause I had already come to my conclusions on nine 11. So by the time Sandy Hook came, it was like, okay, you know, but, and, and Robbie Parker and these people are already exposing themselves on the day, but yeah. my dad had seen my posts on Facebook. So what he did is he never wrote to me on Facebook. He decided he's going to write to me on Facebook on the wall and tag me. So everybody sees it. And he told yeah. me how ashamed how ashamed he was to be my father because of my views on Sandy oh. Hook. And you're uninvited to Christmas. He uninvited me to Christmas publicly. And I've seen him about three times since then. And that was, as you know, ten years ago as they're rolling out more of these things. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 So yeah, yeah, the 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 nine eleven thing was the uh the really brought it it got me on down the road to where I looked at every I absorbed everything I could and the internet was was new in the terms of the high speed aspect of it. So I absorbed everything I could all the way up until twenty fourteen when of course the everything went upside down. So what was big for you between 9-11 and 2014? Because obviously we're going to spend a lot of time on Flat Earth. Before we do, we'll probably take a quick break because I do need to use the restroom. But what was after 9-11? Was it like the Fed? Was it um, – what, what else was uh, – did you look all, at probably... – all, all that stuff. I mean it was – I mean I, I revisited the JFK thing quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh went into uh the roswell cover-up which i was i i really really enjoyed even though it's kind of a oh, fringe thing what about the moon like landing that. was the moon did you look at the moon landing before uh, i Flat i Earth? did i did but i didn't take it that seriously because the ufo guys i'm old enough to remember that when people people don't remember this but after the moon landing thing you know after we were done in 1972 the the nerds were questioning it immediately but there was, you know, 1972, where are you going to go? You had to go to UFO conventions just to talk to people about it. There were no forums. Mm -hmm. The bullet, even the yeah. electronic bulletin boards weren't out yet. And so it was a really, really fringe group and nobody took them that seriously. Um, I mean, you heard it, you know, you, you heard the jokes. It's like, yeah, it was totally faked, man. But you didn't, there was nothing behind it. No one, you know, there wasn't a lot of momentum behind it. So, yeah, I knew about it, but I didn't, I didn't have the resources. What about uh, like other things that people looked at, like Black Knight satellite, reptilians? Uh, what about uh, oh, yeah. also, also, what were your thoughts on paranormal at that point? Had you had any paranormal or supernatural experiences? We didn't really touch. No, that. no. the The closest I got, what, what I had the I had the privilege of watch watching something little little fringe video on um, 
uh, on line. I can't remember if it was YouTube or not. Where this British guy at the very end, he goes, you want to see some weird stuff? He goes, get some night vision binoculars and start watching the sky. And I'm going, hey, you know what? That sounds pretty cool. So I hunted around and shopped around on Amazon and got um, some night owl night vision binoculars and thought, yeah, this would be kind of fun. Again, we, if, when you're single, you know, I had a lot of free time on my hands. So, and I was in Colorado, beautiful weather, you know, cl crystal clear skies. And I went out to the soccer field with almost no light pollution at all and, you know, turned them on. Looking up there, I'm going, wow, that's a lot of satellites, right? And just, just the sky was crawling with stuff. It was looked like bugs. It was like, wow, there's a lot of stuff happening up there. And um, and but I was but I was getting bored. I was like, yeah, yeah. Again, the 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 disbelief is like, wow, they're satellites, right? And then all of a sudden, I'm tracking one. Not even an hour into it, tracking one. I'm going, eh, it's boring, boring, boring. Why'd you stop? It stopped. Why is it stopped? And it was, and then it like made a slow left hand turn, and then just punched it and went ballistic, like it was lost. And I'm like, all right, I'm going, what the hell did I just see? And then I started watching more and more of these things, and it was, and I did that for years. I mean, I did that for at least three, four years. Where I mean, I would go out in the snow at two in the morning, and uh, and lay on my back, and and uh, you know, what you know. What, turn on it. I couldn't record it because the stupid things didn't have any video output, which I think is a conspiracy in itself. And uh, and I would watch the stuff. And so that was the, the the my big kick that I was on. I mean, the other stuff was fun, fine to look at, but this was fascinating to me because I could see it all the time. And so I knew it wasn't plain. Sorry, go yeah, ahead. So I, I was just going to ask you. So obviously, at that time when you saw it, and then where you're at now on your journey, you might have a different perspective on what you think you saw. Uh, oh, what yeah. did you think? What did you think then? I know you said you thought satellites, but now obviously you saw a different movement. Oh, no, no, movement. no. There's absolutely there's tons and tons of stuff crawling around in the sky and it's not us. I, I, I will give credit to the American government in that they are huge believers in take the credit for whatever you can. You know what I mean? Meaning um, they, they took credit for, for stuff. All It's like, oh, you took credit for Roswell. OK, fine. Uh, you're going to take credit for the 1899 Aurora thing or the 1561 Nuremberg thing or anything else. You're going to take credit for that. So, no, the they there's a bunch of stuff up there. And but my belief then hadn't changed, didn't change much when I got into Flat Earth in that. I just think they're older versions of us. So what beforehand, mean um, meaning that every civilization on this world, I mean, if, you, if you've looked in any of the, the fringe stuff, I mean, you know about the, the sunken cities off of Japan, the sunken cities off of India, and Pumapunku, and the Bosnian pyramids, and the real pyramids, and Bimini Road, and so on and so on. There's remnants from previous civilizations, lots of them. We have no, no idea what the hell happened. But we, it's very, very possible, for me anyway, that the, whoever, you know, some of the survivors of these had advanced technologies. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, they have rules. They have protocols, which is, yeah, you can travel here and there. You can make maybe buzz a forest or, you know, a, a random boat, but you're not going to land in the main street of anywhere. If you do that, you're you're screwed. We're going we're to mess with you. Again, the 1561 Nuremberg event is fascinating um, in that regard. But but I never I, I always thought because they were traveling. What was weird was they were traveling using almost like using our highways as guideposts mm -hmm. so i mean i was watching a lot of them were going north south in colorado off of 25 and 93 which was which were north south and the planes the airport and they were traveling much much higher at least a hundred thousand feet whereas the um the the planes the dia denver international airport they were going inbound from the north and outbound through the south so they're really easy to tell apart from each other and the big thing was planes have that those stupid blinking lights underneath them yeah yeah and these things never ever ever did so, but no, I, I think they're just old versions of our civilization, you know, they're previous civilizations that for whatever reason are hanging around, but uh, they can't just interact on a regular basis. You want to make an appearance every once in a while? Sure. But, uh, but not, it's really tough to do nowadays with all the smartphones, which by the way, if you want to circle back, is the, um, the reason why you can never pull off a 9-11 now. Is because there's there's too many there's six billion smartphones in the world. You could never do it now. Everybody's got a freaking camera in their head. There there would be so much footage and uh, high speed internet was 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 you know would wreck that whole operation. Two thousand one was the last chance you could really do that.
Yeah. Um, okay, we're going to take a break in a minute and come back and get into when you started to first have some flat earth things on your radar at all, the very early sure. start of it for you. But before mm -hmm. we do, uh, I did want to ask you about one other topic. You are really into like military tech and gear and stuff like that. How did your sure. uh, likeness for all that come? Because you talk about it a lot. I know you're really into that type of stuff. Uh, I'm a big small I, I started out as a, a small art that was one of those things my my parents were were big on you know they weren't big on weapons and so it was kind of a taboo for me but it kind of went along with my love for fireworks and explosives mm -hmm. so I was one of those guys and, and and if anyone ever dug up one of my old annuals good lord if anything I ever did anything I would sign like my junior and senior year I signed, signed it like guns and bombs forever <laughs> because you know, I did I did fire. It's like, a, it's like a manifesto, dude. They're gonna yeah, yeah it's something you wouldn't <laughs> want to put down now nowadays. But this is pre nine yeah. eleven. So and then I joined. Um, you know, I I just kind of liked all the aspects of it. I liked I love the idea of firepower. There was there was this line from Patton, where um he not the movie but the actual Patton where he goes the the basic principle of war has never changed. He goes deliver the maximum amount of firepower in the minimum amount of, of time. And so I was just fascinated with that. And so well, like when I went over to, when I drank my first year of, of uh, university, uh, I joined ROTC just mm -hmm. to see what it, what it was about. And I was like the only person in there that wasn't a military brat. Did not know that was a thing. That like military families have mili kids that have, mil you know, military, end up joining the military. So anyway, it was just one of those things I studied a lot of. I mean, I read every periodical I could and was a big and, and remember this was also the timing was right the um this is when assault weapons were were just the ideas were just going everywhere where they had you know where they were, had to rein it in let's mm -hmm. put it this way there were gun shows back in the day back in like the 90s where you could just i remember going there one day when the atf showed up right mm -hmm. and they had no jurisdiction the ATF showed up and you could go to these gun shows and, you know, these were merchant marines and military guys and, and policemen and people were just swapping guns. They were, they were trading guns like, like baseball cards, you know, on a regular basis. Things were changing hands without any paperwork at all, just changing hands. And the ATF came in, they were just dumbfounded. They were like, oh, we got to do something about this. This is, this is horrible. This is going to screw up everything. I mean, remember their whole paperwork system is based on registration. And so, yeah, that's that's how I, I mean, I always had a passion for it and followed it to uh, its logical conclusion, which was, you know, getting hit for federal felonies. Yeah. Awesome. So why don't I give a quick a uh, couple people gave me a super chat on Rockfin. I'm just going to say hello to them and then me and sure. you will take a quick we'll take a quick break. We'll come back and we'll get into Flat Earth, NASA and okay. uh, all the good stuff a lot of people came for. I mean, it's been okay. really good so far. It's been really interesting. I think that people really enjoy this so far. Getting oh, cool. Getting your story. Cool. Yeah, man. Because I mean, hey, hey how many how many uh, flat Earth interviews have you done now? Like four hundred. You're getting close, right? Uh, I unfortunately I I stopped keeping track after four hundred because oh, there was there a bunch go. of them that I couldn't put up for copyright things. For you know the the when you do really big ones, they won't let them put them let you put it on your channel because they the, of a rights issue so the bigger ones you do you can't do it um ones from other countries i couldn't put on and there was just every once in a while i don't know i put 300 and something on my channel the ones i could but no i think it's it's between four and five hundred at this stage i think yeah awesome all right so let's we got we got tons to cover with uh flat earth and nasa and just okay. everything i mean we can get into so much so let's take a quick break uh mark we got about how long is this six minutes okay? are you gonna we'll play right are you gonna play something yeah, I got something to play. We'll be back in six minutes, guys. Uh, just stick with us. My Awakening, number 75 with Mark Sargent. My Awakening, 76, will be Wednesday, same time, 8 p.m. with Lucky Haskins. Guys, don't go anywhere. We'll be back in six minutes. All right, everybody. Welcome back. My Awakening, episode number 75. I did say I was going to shout out the tips on Rockfin, and then I stepped away and I forgot. So let me say thanks to you guys real quick. Patrick Locked. Tip twenty dollars on Rockfin. Rachel Hilger tipped twenty dollars and said, "Got a tip for this epic show. Fork it over, peeps. Legend in action, but tip every show. Show the love." And Jazzin Valencia, Valencia tipped five dollars and said, "Great interview." So, Mark, we're gonna get into flat Earth with you, 
uh, yeah. and when it first came on your radar. But um, I, maybe I'll just give my little story real quick so you can have an idea where it kind of might parallel in some ways with yours and, and stuff. Because sure. it's, it's interesting because we were both there, obviously, in the early days of it. We saw a lot of things go along, a lot of disinformation come. There's, a, there's so much good stuff we can get into. But um, for me, it was like I said... Uh, I don't know if you've heard before, but the moon landing stuff I looked at in 2011, and that was complete trash after looking at 9-11. And then I kind of right. gradually went through satellites in the ISS. And then in 2014, I don't know if you ever saw this video. Um, there's a video that actually they came out in 2012. So they were pushing disinfo on YouTube against Flat Earth way earlier than a lot of people think. Um, there was a oh, yeah. video called uh, Things They Don't Really Want You to Know. And this episode was called Flat Earth. Have you seen that one? No, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Anyways, it was a three-minute video. Uh, I saw it in the summer. I saw it in the summer of 2014, and it was complete disinfo. You know, water over the edge. The sun was actually going under the disc that was going up, and the whole thing. But right in the beginning, they showed a spacewalk, and this is my clicking point for for flat Earth. They showed a spacewalk, and they were like, "Flat Earthers think NASA's uh, NASA's photos are fake." And I know it, photos can be fake, but to think all the imagery is fake. And right there, I'm like, well, wait a minute, 9-11, right? Like, okay, the imagery probably all is fake. And then from there, I think the next thing I saw, uh, there was some early stuff that came out about discrepancies to do with the Southern Hemisphere with GPS and flight routes. And that was about all there was. Uh, and, and, and I did a show with a guy, it was interesting, in 2014 in December, and he knew a lot about the topic. Like, I knew very little. I was just start because there was nothing really out other than, you know, Matt Boylan's videos, which weren't very clear on anything, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. But he, he was like a flat earther for like 10 years, this guy. He was just telling me all this stuff about our cosmology, and I was like, holy crap. But fast forward a little bit. A few months later, Eric Dubay comes out. I want to say, what is that, about March of 2015? And then you were yeah. like April? And then you were like April? And, uh, you know, um, well, the, the clue, the clues were in February, but, but Eric was doing stuff at the, at the back half of 2014 and I didn't know, okay, but he didn't, he didn't re he didn't start taking off till 2015 either, but yeah. that was just it. He and, he and Matt were doing stuff in 2014, but nobody was really looking at it because they assumed because it wasn't easy enough. Yeah. And, what and what I tried to tell doing, people was like, what? they were doing stuff then. I'm sure they were looking uh, much longer before too. So like, like yourself yeah. too, we all want to know like when you started looking, cause we all know you came out with it in the spring of 2015, but when did you, right. you know, start looking into the topic? Oh, 20, 20, summer of 2014. It was, um, I was, I was living in a house in Boulder and I was bored out of my tree and I had, and YouTube was, was, you know, everything again, still never married, a lot of free time in my hands and, uh, went through just about every conspiracy you could think of. And then I remember that the part that got me, and I, I know I've told the story a bunch of times where there was a flat earth video on the, the right hand side. And I remember clicking on it. And for some reason I got physically flushed, embarrassed, not a lot embarrasses me. And I was alone in a house with the drapes pulled, right? I, I, nothing on the internet should have embarrassed me, by, especially not Flat Earth. I was going, what is wrong with me? Why am I getting all weird, you know, by clicking on this video? And it was by this guy in Europe, uh, Jay Henning Collegia or something like that. And I think he was using some clips from Matt as, as well. Uh -huh. And I thought, wow, this is really cool. But I, but I hate it. You know, flat Earth is an awful thing. So I, I, I'll, I'll look into it and I'll stomp this thing out. And I literally, off and on, hammered on it for nine months, and then in February of 2015, I just gave up. I literally, I'm not kidding you. It was this weird Jerry Maguire old movie. So uh, hammering on it, like you are really trying to take the certain points and trying to debunk them, or like, and trying, so trying to de would... yeah, debunk flat Earth because it, everyone knows that the the. the the wonderful thing about flat earth is everybody starts in the negative. Everybody starts yeah. in the hole and you have to claw your way out. And by the time you do, you realize you can't go back. You can't, you can't go back into it. And so what happened for me, cause I'm stubborn. I mean, I just worked on it. It worked on it. It's like, there's no way, there's no way. And then Did all of a sudden- Did you do any experiments? Started... Did you like go out and no. make any experiments? No, or... there wasn't. I didn't have any resources. I mean, I had, I still have it right here. And I know that you're going to love me showing it, which is, I actually joined that uh, the that Flat Earth Society, which I condemned in one of my early videos. I love that people come back. And it's like, 
It's like they say, you know, he joined the Flatter Society. He's a shill. I'm going, I'm the one that told you not to join it because I joined it. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's right here. I was the guy. So, in fact, it's dated uh, 2014. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, October 28th, 20, 2014. It was done by this, uh, this guy, uh, Shelton. Shenton? Shenton. Anyway, out of Hong Kong. Anyway, so I joined that just to figure out what was going on. And I also thought that was very suspicious because I was one of the first people to go into the Velvet Rope of the, uh, the forums, the actual Flatter Society forums, and, and it was being run by trolls. The, 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 the gatekeepers were the trolls. I'm going, why are there dedicated trolls in this freaking site? There's only like 500 well, people that are even yeah. part of this. And it started to click into me to where finally I, I started realizing that the, the scale was going to tip, but there was no way I was going to put a video online unless I could answer every question I could come with, with on my own. Meaning, yeah. you know, every, I was trying to put, think from the other side and say, okay, what, is pe- what are people going to ask me? when I do this and I just started having these weird conversations with myself. It's like, okay, okay. And then finally I, you know, February 10th of 2015, I woke up and I said, okay. And it, I mean, it was some of the clearest writing I've ever done. And it was this, that was a real surreal moment for me where I wake up and I could hear the narrative in my head, in my voice. And it's like, and I paragraph by paragraph and I sat down and I just started typing it and typing it and typing it. And by the time the sun came up, I had it. I had the first clue and I was like, okay, well, might as well narrate it because why the hell not? So I put on, you know, crappy $20 mic and, and, and narrate it. And it's like, well, I might as well attach some slides. I knew nothing about video editing, obviously, and then put out the clues, which also, by the way, I, I've got to take some credit inspired Jaron because he thought the workmanship on the clues was so amateur hour. And then he's like, if this guy can make videos, I absolutely can make them. And he did, and but he he even went be- better than that. He went down to like the secondhand store and bought a really old version of I think Microsoft Studio or something like that for like yeah. six bucks or something. And yeah. and he went home and made it. So anyway, hopefully I didn't go too off track there. No, no, that was good. So so what type of initial response did you get? Was it mostly positive, or did you get a lot of negative response from people? almost no negativity that was that was the weird part i was the reason why and i still do to this day you know my my phone number my email address my physical mailing address is out there is because i wanted people to find me because i want to be like okay i missed something right obviously can't be actually flat so somebody call i didn't mind again remember by that point i had already done thousands of hours of phone work and you know high level tech support so i didn't care about people calling me i mean i'd had people threaten me and cry and yell and scream on the phone all the time so pe- somebody calling me you know yell at me for flatter like that wouldn't be anything so the people that called me it was mostly wonder which is like yeah. what is going yeah. on and people for whatever reason the even though it's one of the oldest topics ever no one had talked about it in a modern sense and so people were calling me, you know, the, the, um, I, uh, the first podcast was fakeologist, which was weird. He called me live yeah. during a live broadcast and I, said, I, I know, think this I know, guy, I know him good. I used to do nine 11 shows with him sometimes. Yeah. Cool. He, he, yeah, he, yeah, he's a big nine 11 guy. And he called me live and could have swore. It's like, well, this guy's obviously fake. We're to see if he's even answers the phone. I answered the phone live. I didn't have any idea. And we, we talked for like an hour and a half, which was great. Um, but then when I knew there was, that things were getting weird was when uh, Coast to Coast called me up because, mm-hmm. which is why the, the, if again, if I ever live long enough, uh, you know, I might write a book called Unsolicited, which is how this thing happened, where this producer out at Coast to Coast called me up and she goes, all right, let me, she goes, she goes, tell me about Flat Earth. And I go, I go, I don't know. I made some videos about Flat Earth. What do you want to know? And she goes, well, what's your DVD? She goes, can you send me your DVD? I go, no, I don't have a DVD. She goes, well, send me your book. And I go, I don't have a book. And I could hear her getting angry on the other side. She goes, what's your website? And I go, (laughs) I've only been doing this for two months. I got nothing. And she's going, why am I talking to you? And I go, you called me. I don't know why. I go, how'd you, I go, why are you calling me? She goes, well, I heard you on ground zero. uh, So she goes, you sounded like you know what you're talking about. She goes, give me five minutes. Give me your nickel tour. And I go, fine. And I give her my nickel tour. And she goes, you're on next Thursday. And I go, what? I go, what does that mean? And only later when I was talking to um, Rob Skiba, when he had asked me, 
he had said, he goes, how many times did you have to call uh, Coast to Coast before they booked you? And I go, what are you talking about? <laughs> because I didn't know that people solicit that place on a regular basis. I mean, for years before they get on. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there was this weird, if you believe in things happen for a reason, when I was on with George Norrie, and I didn't know this guy from Adam, only that I saw him do a guest spot of like an Ancient Aliens. And I owned like the first six seasons on DVD of Ancient Aliens. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of, at least I knew what he looked like. And I remember this point where he stopped and he goes, he goes, I know there's a lot of people in the chat room that are saying, George, destroy him. But if I do that, Mark won't be able to get his message out. Going, if you do it, I mean, you can try, George, but you're going to get smoked. I mean, even if you were <laughs> well, young. Well, what well, wasn't. But but the fact that he was actually but he was basically saying, and and it was it was kind of a give and take because he was willing basically to entertain the whole flat Earth thing as long as I didn't condemn the moon missions. Uh -huh. And and it's like because he's a big moon mission guy, and uh, and only was a big moon, not anymore, not anymore. He's not. Uh, but back back then he was, and so anyway, so yeah, that's when I knew. Well, that, that might. Uh, that's when you knew what? Well, that, that's when I knew that this thing had kind of a, a mind of its own. Because the things, doors were opening and things were happening that I didn't have anything to do with. I never had to pick up a phone. I mean, it was just these, these things just started coming, coming my way. And all I had to do was, was, was answer and say, yeah, yeah. And I mean, even so far, the, uh, the weird Matt Boylan thing. Matt could have totally taken this whole thing over. Totally taken this whole thing over. Mm -hmm. And he didn't because he was the whole that aloof artist bit. I mean, that part was absolutely true where he, he was like, no, no reporters. I'll talk to him when I'm ready. And by the time he was ready, it was too late. They didn't want to talk to him anymore. And then when he finally did do an interview, it turned out he. Whoa, he so what happened out. on the no? I didn't hear the Nori interview. Uh, I might have. But did you. Uh, so did you try a different approach or did you say, no, we're not doing that. We'll get right into the moon landing. Because honestly, like uh, they certainly go hand in hand. But maybe you could, uh, no, no, you, you I could maybe, cause... maybe knowing how much they're into UFOs and the moon landing and stuff, you would just come with a completely different strategy and approach to maybe make it resonate with them. What, what I, would you do? As, as you know, there are, with the reason why Flatter does as well as it does is we have a shotgun pattern approach. We can hit you with so many different aspects. Oh, yeah, you might be able to shut down this or this or this, but everything else is getting through. And you can, in fact, you can even so far to say, we're not going to talk about this. It's like, fine, I don't need that. We got all. We have so many different ways of convincing you. So when he, when he and his producer said, "Yeah, we're not gonna, we're not gonna do the 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 moon landing stuff," it's like fine. I, in fact, I didn't even didn't even acknowledge it as an issue because at that point I was so the the clues were were so still the the ink was still drying on them that it, I just you know went into other things. It, yeah, honestly, it, 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 it can be better. Like, I tell people this a lot. Like, on my channel, so, you know, everybody knows I'll talk about 9-11, Mandela Effect, Flat Earth, you sure. know, like, different things, right? But if sure. I'm going to be on an interview, you try not to mix polarizing topics if you're trying to convince somebody of something really big. Now, you got, now you're trying to convince them of two really big things that they have to all of a right. sudden accept. Right. You know what I mean? So, but at, yeah. the, at the same time, you don't want to avoid things, but there is a strategy to it, and you probably picked the right strategy. Yeah, and, and what, I, what I also learned was, and I learned from producers very, very early on, because it's not, you know, the on-air talent, the, the people you're talking to on the shows, when you get to bigger and bigger shows, they're not the people that are pulling the strings. It's the producers behind the scenes. They're the, the people on, on, you know, they're just reading things. Yeah. Um, and so like I, my big goal was to make sure that I made it through the interview. I never, ever got cut off and I never wanted to get cut off. So when like, for, for example, when I did the, uh, the good morning Britain thing against that, uh, the American astronaut, Terry Verts, I know people were, were upset with me because I wasn't attacking Terry. I'm going, look, if I was in the studio with him, yeah, I might have a chance of attacking it, but I was coming in through Skype and Terry was in the studio. And you got to remember that you've got producers in your ear with their finger on the kill button. And yeah. all they have to do is make one little, you know, flinch and it'd be like, oh, we seem to have lost Mark. We'll try to get him back after the commercial. And it never, ever happens. So all I want to do is go the distance. And I was perfectly fine with it. I mean, you know, sure. all I wanted was to, to, to get as much information as possible out there without, you know, getting, letting the host lose their minds. Yeah, so you that you probably did the right thing. So you've done, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of interviews. You basically, I have heard you everything from high school kids to anything. You won't like say yes to everything, uh, and that's cool. 
so there is some, uh, obviously, as you know, just like I, I take some for th- different things, you definitely take a lot of criticism for things. So let's bring up one of yep. the hot button topics. Uh, you, you, you go under the motto that all media is good media and a lot of people like that idea. A lot of people don't like that idea. You want to get yep. into that a little bit and tell, tell me uh, why, it's, uh, it's not that all, all media, it's not that any media is good media. There's a, the, the, the original saying is even bad media is free, mm-hmm. meaning there are tons of people out there, especially nowadays, especially with social media that would let anything in fact okay i'll give you i'll give you a good example there was um uh, a producer i was talking to i was doing a radio interview for a, a station that eminem owned out in detroit oh, what a weird interview where they opened up the phone lines there wasn't even a call-in show and they opened up the phone lines because people were calling from their cars and they were really really angry and they were yelling and swearing and doing all this fun stuff and i remember at the end uh, the producer comes on and he comes on and he goes he goes wow he goes and so I'm so glad you stuck with us on that one. I go, I go, why? I go, you think it went well? He goes, it went great. And I go, what do you mean? He goes, oh, you don't get it. He goes, it doesn't matter whether you love a topic or you hate a topic, as long as they're engaged in the topic. Mm-hmm. In fact, we, in fact, there was another uh, interview I did, uh, a great example down in um, uh, New Zealand, where it was a radio station and it was, uh, they were letting people call in. And afterwards the producer called up uh, you were still on the line with me and they said uh, said really really great just to, so you know there was a whole bunch of people that wanted to talk to you that were in support of flat earth i go yeah but you didn't let those calls through and he goes why would we <laughs> he goes there's nothing controversial <laughs> about those calls and and that's that's the point you yeah you, you gotta remember that the people love to hate things and the producers pick up on that i mean the entire reason jersey shore existed <laughs> was because people love to hate that show and you know they, that's just one of the what's it's it's taking soap opera stuff to the new level. So yes, I, I do believe in as long as it's somewhat constructive. But I yeah. wasn't kidding when I said that you know because I did that that commercial where you know the, the 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 theme of the commercial was called foolproof, which was, and I, I said look I would have done way worse. I go I go they could have tied me to a chair and thrown pies at me as long as I got to say flat earth. At one point during the shoot they asked me if I would renounce flat earth on camera. You know just for a joke and I said no cuz no. you're going to use it. I, I go you yeah. can't you won't get me to say that. But uh, and it didn't have anything to do with you know whether or not I was going to get paid. But, yeah, that uh, would be way it, that would be way over the line. <laughs> yeah, because you know they you know they would use it, which is also one of the big. Of course. Even though I say that all media is good media, I treat everything absolutely are, are everything you, like. Are it's... you are you wary now though? Like, because they've done a lot of things to chop people up and make people look bad. Are you wary about doing things that aren't live, like flat Earth interviews, because of what the media can do to put things in a bad light? Say it one more time. Are, are you wary of doing things that are pre-recorded rather than live? Like live's a little oh, safer no, for you, Oh, no, no, right? no, no. Because it, I know that some people are, and I don't blame them because, but I know the power of editing. For example, you know, I'll give you a quick, two quick examples. One would be the documentary, which we, you know, we shot for seven months and they whittled it down to a hundred minutes. So they're going to turn it any way they want. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to, I mean, I've done interviews that have lasted... 30 35 minutes in fact i did one because what you don't understand is they're looking for this a particular sound bite they're looking for you to get so comfortable that you slip right and say something just out there you know um uh you know the like like for example um there was a a a reporter i remember he had me under the hot sun for like 40 minutes i was hot mic'd up and he was asking me asking me and he did that deliberately he was hoping that eventually i'd snap and eventually he stops the interview and he goes he goes Look, man, I'm not getting anything. He goes, why? Why are you? Why are you even keeled? Why? Why are you not yelling and screaming? And I'm going, why would I? I go, I go, I, I was you five years ago. Why? Why would I be yelling and screaming? And that that happens all the time. You know, they they wait for you to get comfortable, and all of a sudden be like, Donald Trump is the living in- incarnation of King Tut. You know, something weird. And then that's the that's the clip they're going to use, because well, why the hell not? But yeah, so I'm, I'm you... wary, but at the same time, what are you going to do? Um, we watched it too many times. Uh, sometimes it works in your favor, sometimes it doesn't. Like the, um, the salt and sea experiment, 
where Jaron was live streaming it for what five hours or something like that, and they wiped out the in the editing. You know, the they you don't understand that the field producers shoot as much as they can. They send it off to whatever headquarters, and then they chop it up, and they removed the most of the experiments that were done that day because it didn't fit with the narrative. So you just got to be careful that you don't see anything that can be taken out of context, something really weird. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's about it. You, you just try to be careful. Now, obviously we saw the rise of the disinfo 2015, 2016, big time at flat earth being yeah. addressed by people like Neil deGrasse and all these people. Uh, yeah. What's your take on Neil deGrasse Tyson? Like, does he know that the earth is flat? Probably not. Um, anyone over, and I've said this many times, anyone over the, um, in a physical science of a master's degree or higher, they are so conditioned. And my stance has not changed on that in seven years. They're, they're lost. They're gone. They're, they're never, ever coming back. They have to believe it. Because if, for whatever reason, they change their mind, their lives would be ruined. Imagine what happened to, you know, everyone in the chat rooms and everyone listening, you know, when they found out, you know, the world, by the way, isn't, isn't what you think it is. It was devastating. You know, you was just mind blowing. But imagine if you had based your entire career off of that, of saying, oh yeah, it's a globe. And I've researched everything about the globe and space and everything about that. And I've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars and eight to 12 years of school on it. What do you, what happens to you? I mean, you're going to, you're going to curl up in a fetal position in a bottle somewhere mm -hmm. and just drink. And you, you can't you can't do it. You now the, the open minded ones might be able to adjust, but does Neil know for sure? Probably not. Are there some questions that are nagging him that, that he can't answer? Probably. Uh, but at the same time, the, the people have, many people have asked me, it's like, well, wouldn't you tell Neil? I go, No, I wouldn't tell Neil. If I was like the authority, would I tell Neil? No, you want him on stage doing his act without anything going on behind his head. You don't you so don't you want think him you think he might not actually be intentionally lying about all of it and he really thinks he's right and he's just a kind of an arrogant prick. Yeah, yeah, why 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 tell him? I mean, you the what they learned from the Apollo astronauts was there's some things that the human condition can't deal with. And one of it one of them is that, which is you tell you you told the Apollo astronauts why why mm -hmm. it was happening and it crushed them. They all turned into freaking basket cases. They didn't do interviews. They were recluses. They drank. It's like these guys should have been heroes forever, and they totally resented it. Part of it, I think, is just the guilt. Nobody likes to, I mean, it's one thing to be celebrated for something you didn't do, but it's another thing to have actual full-blown parades down major cities and schools named after you and, yeah. and then for something you did not do, which is why the, so the movie Capricorn 1 was so perfect. So you'd probably say the same thing for Bill Nye and some others, I'm guessing. What about Joe Rogan, though? You don't think Joe Rogan legitimately changed his mind, right? He took a paycheck, right? Yeah, Joe what Rogan took a paycheck. And and he and he did it. I mean, he was open about it. He, you know, he had that one weird clip where he stared at the camera when he first heard about it. And he was like, wait, they pay to do disinformation? I will absolutely sell everything, including my mother, you know, for this. And part of him, I think, was joking, but another part wasn't. I mean, the, the one line where... Um, I think it was Alex Jones that said during um, during his weak moments when he was doing his brutal divorce, where he said that they got to Joe, where you know they offered him the carrot and the stick. I mean, come on, mm -hmm. he Joe was. I, I felt bad for him in a way. I mean, yeah, I know I, I wrote some some not kind things of him in, in the book, but he, he remember he was winning. You you've heard some of the stuff of Joe, you know, before all this happened, yeah. where he was. Oh, uh, well, that's things, the thing. When you listen to Joe Rogan's rant about the moon landing being a hoax before you flipped, right. uh, he's right. not just a guy saying it. Like he was very well versed, and he sounds like one of us speaking about it. Yeah, we, all things being equal, anyone that has taken debate in in high school or college, you know that all things being equal, the person with the most conviction usually gets the win. And Joe had tons of conviction, which was the scientists was like, oh, yeah, well, according to blah, blah, they were just regurgitating book, book stuff. And Joe was like, no, here's why it doesn't work. Right. And he was winning. And all of a sudden he goes dark. And when he comes back, I mean, the the ultimate <laughs> sellout thing ever, where he gets that that show called Joe Rogan Questions Everything only ran for one season in the very first episode. In the very first sec segment, he apologized to NASA publicly for everything he ever said. It's like, Wow. And the, and then what do you think it's an accident? He has the biggest podcast in the world. <laughs> really, Joe Rogan? Come on, I've watched his career. He's good. He's not that good. 
No. I mean, yeah, he he knows some people. Can he? Can his producers book guests? Yeah, sure. But you know, I I put him on the same line as of credibility as as Elon Musk now. But he but he knows. I think there's some regret on his side because I think he'd love to get involved. That's why he was. It was so fun to have Eddie. Um, Eddie Bravo do his thing with him because he was using Eddie channeling through Eddie using Eddie as the you know as the puppet to try, try to rile people up but Eddie was only going to do that so often what if I had you on like on a spot real quick and I was like hey you're the flat earth guy give me yeah. five pr give me five proofs real quick and why like what, what are your top five if you had to give people uh, and start, start, you know, five, four, three, two, one, if you can, and then, you know, do your best proof or your best, you know, oh, yeah, 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 bunk, yeah. Um, best globe the, the to bunk five, or whatever. And, and let's, let's the, really get into it and, and discuss it a little uh, bit. The, the, the top five, I'll, I'll give you the examples that I gave the, um, the physicist out of Georgetown. I was, you know, I was supposed to do this big debate with this physicist out of Georgetown set up by a German television company. And what they, they realize is that, scientists do not they're not very they're not very articulate so they they said okay we're, you're going to ask five questions you're going to make your five best points we're going to give them to him and then he's going to record something we're just going to pass these things between to you to each other in fact you guys might not even meet because we're just going to do this this is probably going to be the safest answer otherwise you're just going to talk over him and my, the five points were uh number one with a bullet which isn't my favorite but it's the one that gets most people into it is long distance photography without a question everybody i did not realize when at no at no point during the clues did i ever mention long distance photography i even used the orlando ferguson model the roulette table model mm -hmm. when i was first doing my stuff and people what, what i didn't realize was people were running down to the beach with cameras and shooting long distance photography and calling me up and going dude it's totally flat you, you gotta ditch the orlando thing i was going what are you doing down at the beach it's like well because water lays flat i mean there were people who were, who were educating me on this stuff so that's that's number one with a bullet because everyone can do it there's water everywhere you can shoot long distance anywhere and it's really really easy to do um and all you have to do is remind people of the curvature formula that, that, that's you know a lot of times when people call on my show I, i'll say two things at the end you know what's your favorite flat earth proof and your biggest mandela effect and uh, more often than not people say we see too far i mean that's you know yeah you see that's too far. The number one yeah but 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 again but the average person doesn't get it they don't understand because you know, I, I, the the great example of that would be the um, the retired SR seventy one pilot. You know, from the from the Air Force, who goes around and tells people. You know, he does public speaking and talks about how cool it was to do the SR seventy one. But he he talks a little bit about specs, which is oh, I was up over Phoenix and I could see Los Angeles from Phoenix at about seventy thousand feet, and people are going, wow, wow, that's really cool. Didn't occur to anybody he shouldn't be able to see Los Angeles from from phoenix and then he said yeah and then when i looked to my right i could actually see where the canadian rockies met the american rockies mm -hmm. and that's even further and then mm -hmm. it's like in that i mean that was like early jay tolan media stuff with before jay tolan was doing his own thing jay tolan didn't even know didn't even realize what the hell it said anyway the guy couldn't see the forest for the trees it's not that the pilot knew you know he he didn't know what he was seeing he was looking he's like wow i can see really far nobody thinks like oh i should be it should be yeah. not be able to yeah. see that far um, second one would be the, um, my favorite, which is, uh, vacuum versus gravity got, got to be for me because oh, no yeah. one, no one can answer that one, which is, uh, uh, if you have a vacuum chamber above you, uh, and you, and you pop the valve, what happens? The air rushes upstairs. It's instant. It's violent. It's not this slow hissing thing. It's, it's brutal. It's amazingly fast. We've got horrible submarine and, and deep oil well you know accidents because of pressure differential i mean people don't understand when you have molecules versus no molecules it is instant so the the question is if the air rushes upstairs when you go outside why is the atmosphere still here yeah. why isn't it sucked off into space in fact I, and and people and i've i've had people you know jump and say well because of gravity you mean the same gravity that couldn't keep the air in your room from going upstairs that same gravity but same gravity happens? that lets a, it, let, it lets a butterfly uh, take off, but it holds buildings and oceans down. I mean, it's just so ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's that's but that's my favorite because no one can come back. Long distance photography, you can come at it with all sorts of different angles, and you know, there's all sorts of atmospheric effects you can you can use. Vacuum versus versus gravity. No, you got nothing. In fact, I have yet to tell have anyone tell me what happens at the edge of space. What happens? You know, what happens? You know, and where is it? 
it's let's say it's 600 miles up like what what happens there are you telling me there's some particles and then you have a vacuum next to it and nothing happens they just kind of tickle the particles nothing equalizes no no never happens um number three would be the uh the eclipse shadow uh which which again I, during, during the documentary i had a pleasure of seeing which is the moon is 2,000 miles wide if you believe mainstream but the, the but the blackout zone of the eclipse is only 70 miles wide which is weird because that's what we say the moon is which is just yeah. coincidental you know roughly you know 70 miles so if shadows are only the same size or larger how does a 2,000 mile wide object create a blackout zone that's only 70 miles wide? Planes, I don't care how high they are, you never see a tiny plane shadow flying over you when it goes over. It's always the same freaking size. You know, mm -hmm. Cessnas, doesn't matter if it's a jet airplane or whatever, you, you know it's, it's a freaking plane, it's huge. So why does that ever, why doesn't that happen? And, and in, even if you could convince me, it's like, okay, fine, then reverse it. If the, if the earth is 8,000 miles wide and the moon is on the other side, then why isn't there a 250 mile wide blackout zone on the moon? Why doesn't the moon turn into a giant eyeball? Why does it get this weird, this weird shadow on it that doesn't make any sense? Um, number four would be the um, uh, the temperature of the moon, which I thought was a joke for a while. Which is uh, that was in fact I didn't even learn about it until the first year. Which is the the moon temperature is. Um, it generates a cold light. So if it's 90 degrees in the sun, it's 80 degrees in the shade, right? Fahrenheit. And But if it's 50 degrees in the moonlight, it's 60 degrees or warmer in the moon shade. Yeah, so opposite, the, opposite properties of the sun, which it says is supposed to be reflecting its light. Yeah, so, yeah, it absolutely, I mean, I, it absolutely so, is reversed. So and, you, and, you, and if, would you, you, would, you would agree with, well, I shouldn't say agree. I haven't stated what I believe, but you, you do think the moon is its own light source? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's online sword. Absolutely. And in fact, I mean, how could it not be? If you take a magnifying glass to moonlight, and we've tested this, and take a magnifying glass to moonlight, why does it get colder? How is yeah. that even remotely possible? Um, and again, scientists, what I love about that one is scientists won't even touch it because they've never heard of it. Yeah. You know, it's one of those things where we bring it up to people, you know, scientists, and they're like, the what now? <laughs> it's like, yeah, man, it's a thing. In fact, there's a wonderful video on my channel where a guy broke out a camera with predator vision. And, you know, he was not a flat earther, and he's shining around his neighborhood going, I'll be damned. You know, it's, it's generating its own cold light. Now, again, does that approve a flat earth? No, it doesn't, but it destroys the relationship between the sun and the moon. It means that their own, their own light source is independent. Um, last but not least is the, uh, the Van Allen radiation belt. No question for me. Um, and that, in fact, I'm pretty sure that was part of the clues, which was, um, are they deadly? Yes or no? It's a simple question. If they're deadly, then how the Americans make multiple trips through them, uh, round trips, nobody died, nobody got radiation poisoning, nobody even got cancer. There's still four of these guys walking around, as far as I know, I think, maybe three now. Um, and they did it with no shielding whatsoever. You know, no lead, no gold, no, no huge volumes of water, how'd they do it? And you say, well, okay, well, it's not that deadly. It's like, well, no, because you go to the NASA website and there's, you know, a wonderful movie on it where they, um, uh, they said it's absolutely deadly. Anyway, those, those five questions, I threw at this guy and he folded. That was it. He said, yeah, well, I'm not doing this. And that was it. The Germans went home and, and we never ran the segment. And the reason I, I felt kind of bad about it was because scientists, when you get to a certain level, especially when you get to a PhD, you're very tunnel visioned, meaning you, you only like talking about what you can talk about. You don't, you, you stay in your lane and you don't, mo the most common thing they'll say is like, I'm not comfortable talking about that or that's not my area of specialty. So I don't blame him. And it's like, yeah, he might be able to deal with um, uh, the, the Van Allen belts, maybe, maybe uh, the moon cold light, maybe. But then you get into the shadow aspect of it and long distance photography and gravity. There's, there's too many disciplines where they, they just wouldn't be comfortable with. So, but yeah, those are my five big ones. So uh, I want to talk to you about some things that are uh, more factual, like you just did right there. But I do want to talk into your your take and your theories on uh, some different aspects of flat Earth uh, after we sure. do that. I, what was really cool for me, my favorite stuff from you, uh, and I really did love the flat Earth clues. It it was great, and uh, you know it really was nice to hear some people really lay it out. Like you did it without using a lot of complicated things at all. They were kind of just like ideas yeah. to get people thinking. And I think that's why it resonated so good. I also really enjoyed, uh, I really enjoyed Eric's 200 proofs uh, around the same time as well. And then I enjoyed a lot of other content, you know, that other people started coming out with after. Um, but what I really uh, enjoyed from you the most, Mark, is all the subject matter uh, interviews that you had. 
uh, like hmm. submarine guys and different weapons experts. And yep. um, I think that was some of the most valuable information uh, for people in Flat Earth and for people in Flat Earth to use and to be able to make good arguments and discussions with people. And uh, it was, re I, I don't know, maybe, I don't know how everybody in the, the chat feels, but I thought that those subject matter interviews were so valuable. So how did that start? Which was the first one? And uh, were you like really pumped up that you kind of got a series of that going because you, you got a well, lot of good stuff right there. Yeah, and it came in a flurry. And then once it was, they were done, that was it. I just had this weird collection. Um, I didn't have to call anybody. There was a guy, the, the first guy was the, the Navy Sparrow Missile Instructor, Sean McCrary. And he called me up and said, hey, he goes, uh, I've been doing uh, Sparrow Missile Systems training on people for the last 10 years. And uh, he goes, I'm telling you right now, he goes, with the fire, and I heard this over and over. And once he did this, once he did this interview, everybody, so, you know, everyone that ever fired a weapon in the military chimed in and they started calling me, which was, he said, look, he goes, when we work in the firing solutions, when we fire at a target, whether it be Navy, Army, Air Force, submarines, whatever, he goes, you, we do not take into account the curvature of the earth or the spin of the earth, the, the Coriolis effect. We don't, we don't take into account either of those things. And it was, it was really eye opening to me because <clears throat> it didn't occur to me that, uh, that you would have to do this. And, um, I remember master gunner, Brian Burton coming at me later, you know, um, big tanker guy. And he's going, do you know how hard it would be? <laughs> do you know how much more complicated war would be if you had to, had to work these things? In? Because not only would you have to know where the target was and the elevation and how fast it was moving, but you'd also have to look at a map and be like, um, so we're in <clears throat> such and such quadrant. And so we have to take into account the Coriolis this and, and, and you know, the, the it'd be awful. It'd be absolutely awful. And so nobody does. Everybody's heard of it. But nobody uses it. And I mean nobody. Everyone well, from, you know, from on tanks. that point, you know, you know what one of my favorite points is? Like if you ask me my favorite flat earth proofs, one of the what? ones near the top of the list, one of the ones what? near the top of the list would be literally every profession in the world operates their profession as if the earth is stationary and not curved. <laughs> uh, right. Right, right, right. Every, and everybody that called me said the same thing. Um, one of my one of my favorites actually was the uh, the land surveyors, and it's been a while since I even thought about that. Where he said that uh, the rookies always say the same thing. It's like, yeah, don't we have to take into account the curvature? And all the veterans are like, yeah, don't worry about it, because they literally don't worry about it because it never ever comes up. It's never going to factor in, into your equation. He goes every survey. Well, not the geodetic, but the planar surveyor. The fact he goes, the fact that it's called a plane planar surveyor, you know? Yeah. You know, basically every goes every project from your simple building to an automobile factory to an entire airport is built on an absolutely flat, you know, area. It's because it's not he goes, it's not like we're leveling it to be flat. We're shooting it and it's flat. And it's like, oh, yeah, you're going to have to level it out to make sure the water drains a certain way. But it, he goes, it's always going to you know, be flat. And that, he goes, those were great. And, and so anyway, so once Sean got in, every and, and what I loved also was the um, – uh, and we gave Sean every chance to be anonymous, and he absolutely would not do it. Now, he was kind of clever in that I think he had nowhere – he had nothing to lose by doing this because he was going to get out of the Navy anyway. Mm -hmm. So what are you going to do? He either you're going to hit him for a section eight and that's an instant book deal. You know, a guy gets hit for a section eight for believing in flat earth or you're going to let him out. And, and they did. But they people were questioning. It's like, oh, he's not real. He's not real. Not only did he make a video, a full blown video of him flying on a helicopter to his ship. I think it was the Iwo Jima, you know, to his to his naval his naval ship. But he also, and he probably shouldn't have done this, he also went, he shot a video completely silent of him uh, in the Sparrow training missile room, which is like a gymnasium type of mm -hmm. thing where the missile systems are literally just sitting on a gymnasium floor. Not an actual gymnasium, but I mean, it was that sort of size because they train and the, they don't train in the ships, they train on the ground. And all this was, you know, it was completely credible. I mean, he could not have been, and, and people, the other subject matter experts were so moved by that, they called, you know, they called up. And it's like, oh, yeah, let's talk. You know, submarine guys and artillery guys, um, uh, Air Force guys, you name it. They all, they all said the same thing. It's like, yeah, 
especially when it came to firing solutions. So when you hear the stories they run on CNN or whatever, where they say, oh, yeah, this sniper shot an entire mile and had to count for the curvature of the earth. It's like, really? Because I talked to a Howitzer guy. He shoots 30 miles. He doesn't have to. Uh, this missile guy, he shoots classified distances. He doesn't have to. It goes on and on and on. So, yeah, the propaganda was, was thick. Yeah. Um, are there are there any things that get presented as flat earth proofs that you really kind of cringe at? Like, uh, is that a kind of popular? Um, I'm trying to think of anything out there that that there's things that that get all that get some tr traction that I don't I don't brace against it because look if it gets traction it gets traction you know like like the you know what here's one um the the no trees on flat earth mm -hmm. i mean that got tons and tons of traction do i personally go along with it i don't know maybe but as long as people are using that as a as a springboard to get into flat earth i don't really care what it is there's all oh, sorts i didn't mean of, yeah. i didn't mean like uh, other theories i meant like things that are presented as proofs that we don't live on a globe that you think are bad proofs that are kind oh, of like, oh, uh, oh, wishy washy um, no i'm trying to think of, of any that uh no no i can't think of any that uh because because they've been remember it's been seven years now yeah. So they've been anything. Yeah. It, all the early stuff has been weeded out. Yeah, that's so, true. Um, that's a I good mean, point. There's, there's, there's weak ones. Like I'm still shocked to this day that out of all the interviews I've done, that more people didn't bring up the Antar 24 hour Antarctic Sun. I go that, uh, you know, that's obviously the weakest one in my opinion because you can't do it with a single light source. It's got to be either multiple light sources or there's something else going on. But since Antarctica is a, a you know a no go zone and ninety nine percent of the population not only doesn't go there they never have any intention of going there it because it's a non issue so it's like all right fine but so what's your take on uh, for instance fakery on the ISS let me give you my take for a second sure I believe that a lot of that glitches and errors and stuff that we see of course there's going to be errors because things are fake there's inconsistencies or whatever. I right. kind of think that just like you could tell somebody, uh, you talk to a normie, they're not going to talk to you about Tower 7. You talk to them about green screens and wire harnesses on the ISS. It's not even going to matter. You can show them the fakery. It's not even going to matter. Do you think some of the fakery is put there for people like us to have these discussions? Because that's not going to wake up the normies. We come and have the discussions. They listen into our conversations, monitor our conversations, and kind of see where they keep needing to set the bar. Or do you think that uh, some of it is a revelation, a method, a combination of both? Or do you uh, legitimately think it's all mistakes? I think in a lot of cases, um, it's kind of like the, the old that movie quote, which is people are only as good as the system allows them to be. Meaning, if you are getting a huge amount of money for black programs and you know you're going to spend some of it on NASA and you're going to spend the bare minimum that is that you, you need to get away with it. And then, yeah, like what you were saying, set the bar and then change the bar as needed. And, you know, mess around with technology. Remember, 90, 90 whatever percent of the people out there still buy it. And but but don't forget the, what I, the example I want to use here is the '80s. In the '80s, if you guys want to look up some funky footage, and I think I've still got some of it on my channel, the '80s space footage, even though it was shot in, in VHS, was horrible. I mean, you thought the ISS is bad now. The '80s footage was was ridiculously bad. I mean, to where the um, you remember the the astronauts from the Challenger? They were holding those motorcycle helmets for example. And I thought, oh, okay, well, that's just for the picture. That's the press photos. That They're not actually using those helmets. And then later, I'm watching the footage. They're actually using them. Those weren't pressurized suits. They were wearing motorcycle helmets and short sleeve shirts and bare arms and no gloves. And yeah. the reason, and for all these missions, and the reason why they got away with it is because of the 80s. Nobody cared. Nobody gave a crap. Especially in the in the in the mid eighties, you know, before before the Challenger thing, nobody cared. So you, it's like, oh, nobody cares. Let's spend almost nothing. It's like you, Matt, we got a big NASA budget. Let's spend as little as possible. And then they had to up their budget later. But their technology, they realized that when the the problem they ran into, and it's not that they were there were mistakes. It's that the technology. The, the curve of the people at the high speed internet changed everything. People were the reason why they didn't release a second blue marble shot until 2015. They were scared to death 
because people are just tearing it apart. That that's why it's really really difficult to fake anything nowadays, because people just rip it to shreds. So the like the I said you know the if the I've used this example before like moviemistakes.com, you can have a two hundred million dollar production. All it takes is one little weak link, and somebody's going to figure it out. Now most population is. I mean remember the um the first Lord of the Rings. The, the first theater version there was a car driving in the background next to the Shire. Mm. Made it all the way to the theater. Nobody caught it. So many editors, so many different things, and nobody caught it. So it wasn't necessarily a mistake. It was, uh, you know, just one of those little things that, that you know, people miss. So do it, but, but are they watching us? Let, let's put it this way. Nothing is wasted. So, yeah, nowadays they get to watch social media, and, of course, they have access to everything, including this chat room. And they uh, they watch everything we say and, and are they going to but but the problem is when you start doing stuff like that, you can't make big changes because people will notice the difference sort of like why why you can't if you're going to do the fake moon mission again, you can't make it look any different than the original moon, right? You can't put stars in the background now. You can't make a blast crater or anything. There's certain things you have to stick to, which is why you drag your feet on the moon mission. And when it comes to the ISS, you just hope for the best. I mean, it's just amazing to me that people still buy the, the permed hair or, or not even just the permed hair, right? Here's, here's the logic. Sorry, I'm going off in different directions. No, it's but good. It, it's that they have hair at all. I've had engineers contact me and said, look, these people should have everything shaved, including their eyebrows. I go, they shouldn't have any body hair at all. You're the, the, fuel, the, the air filters would be clogged up instantly. It's like nobody should ever, ever have long hair. And yet... That was the way they, they simulated the whole gravity thing. It's like, do the whole Bride of Frankenstein perm the hair straight up? And, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, the hair should flow naturally. And it never, ever did. So I don't know. I mean, it. it I think they try to get away with what they did. And then the Internet caught up with them. Mm -hmm. And now they have to, you know, now you're kind of stuck because, well, you know, you can make a few changes. But we're, we're going to catch everything now. And we do. And we, we catch absolutely everything. Everything from the um the SpaceX thing when Jaron did they, the feed. Where... They make it pretty obvious when they do like Chris Hadfield doing a song with the Bad Naked Ladies and they're on the ground and he's in space. It's like, dude, any audio engineer could tell you they're not going to do that from a few miles away, never mind, up in uh, right. the space station. And, th and then the other times they fake a 13-second delay. It's just so inconsistent with everything. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, so would you... Uh, would you agree that probably, uh, you know, it's all a combination of things. It's Hollywood studios, green screens, wire harness, zero-G planes. Every technique is at their disposal. Yeah, everything from every practical effect you can think of and every green screen effect you can think of. They've tried it all because why wouldn't you? And it's yeah. all backfired. Where they ran into trouble was the live stuff. And I know you have to do it for the kids. It was something, you know, they'd done for a long time, but it, it, it aged horribly which is you don't do live Q&A from there. It, live footage is, there's a reason why television, 99% of television isn't live anymore. It's because there's always mistakes during live broadcasts. And so trying to simulate a live broadcast on any sort, I don't care if it's a practical effect or a green screen or whatever it is, it's tough to do. Very, very tough to do. So, yeah. Um, okay, so... What I wanted to ask you next was, uh, let's back it up a little, uh, and I want your take on how old you think this globe deception really is. I mean, this some people think it's 15, 1600. Some people think as close as 100 years ago. People still mostly thought the Earth was flat. When do you think it really got pushed forward, and how do you think they got it instituted so deeply into the schools and everything at where it is now? mostly it was the physical globe model itself. Uh, I mean, you got to remember that 500 years ago, I mean, yeah, you know, the, the theory was put out there 500 years ago. But back then, most of the population couldn't read and write. So they, they were going to believe, I mean, look, they were just hoping to survive. What I thought was interesting, where it really got interesting for me was the, uh, the George Orwell quote, when he wrote back in uh, 46, I believe, where... Um, uh, where he, again, this is 1946, you know, NASA wasn't even found until 1958, but he, mm -hmm. he goes, you could go onto the street and ask anyone how the world was, a, why they think of the world as a globe. And they just said, what are you talking about? We know it's a globe because it was the, the, the word was passed down from generation to generation. All you had to do was introduce, it was such a simple thing. All you have to do is introduce the physical model of it. And once that was there, you know, generation to generation, it was a given. 
like like algebra. It's like, what are you talking? We we didn't have to talk about it. It's a globe. Everyone knows it's a globe. Look, there's a globe there. There's a globe there. There's a globe there. What I thought was amazing though was looking back because I'm hyper aware of it now is that every television show and every movie that isn't directly related to space has a globe in it somewhere in frame in mm -hmm. multiple places and it never made sense to me i mean modern shows you know 2022 shows going all the way back to the 70s and 80s there's a globe in frame and i remember this little video and i wish i could find it again where there was a guy talking about and i know this sounds like a weird conspiracy but we're talking about flat earth after all where all you had to do, because people don't understand the movie industry, if you want to be a producer, all you have to do is go to whatever film, you know, director. It's like, yeah, I would like to donate, no, no, twenty thousand dollars to your movie, and then it's like, okay, great. What do you want from it? You want a percentage? It's like, no, no, I just want to help set the scene for this room, right? And mm -hmm. and they look at you and be like, that's it. Okay. That's it. All right. Yeah, we'll take we'll take your freaking money. Put, and put all your you little do... trinkets and ornaments and put them where you want. Put the paintings up. Yep. All right. And then you put a and then you put a little globe somewhere over there. And it's a me and, and and what he the guy said was he goes every director will take the money because why wouldn't they the the globe is so innocent so innocuous there's there's no there's no reason for it not to and that gets shown I mean I get that there's a globe in the classroom in school scenes. But why is there a globe on top of the filing cabinet of the detective's office or the doctor's office or the billionaire's? Why is it in frame all the time? There's yeah. no reason for it to be there. And, and, and so anyway, it's the globe reinforcement. So the short version is it was introduced a long time ago and then slowly but surely. And then once they got once the school systems finally got established, that's when it really took off. That's when it really took off because all you had to do was put that stupid toy in the corner right underneath the flag. And I don't care whose flag it is. That's it. You live there underneath that flag and you live there on that globe. And it was it was synonymous. It's brilliant. Do you think. Uh, <clears throat> all right. Let's ask the big question and then we'll move a little bit more forward. I mean, what do you think the biggest motivations were? Obviously, there's lots of agendas that people could talk about, you know, spiritual hiding creation, hiding where we came from, making us feel insignificant, the scam of money <clears throat> control. I mean, there's so many right. different. And I think all those things fall under the umbrella, honestly. What, what, what is your what do you think the biggest motivation was uh, that got this 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 lie going where they wanted to hide the flat earth? Oh, oh, um, but fear mostly um and not ours um fear of losing losing control meaning if you didn't know and i've said this i don't know how many times but i think i've refined it which is if you're the power that be if you're the authority and you you don't even know until almost 1960 do you tell people you know if you find out in 1960 it's like well the old map seemed to be right the gypsy woman was right if that was the case do you tell people it's like no no you do not because there's a risk a, a genuine risk of things collapsing because of it or things severely changing you've already got the, everything right where you want it bringing that out and you know trying to release it, it would freak people out to no end academically uh, economically religiously it would be a nightmare potentially and if there's even a 10 people in power don't take don't take those sort of risks if there's a 10 percent chance that the people are going to burn it all down you don't take it not in 1960 and i i agreed with them and i i challenge journalists with this i go would you have broken that story you know, knowing what you know now, would you have broken that story in 1960? You got to remember that only, what, 13 years earlier, the whole Roswell thing happened. People were losing their minds from mm -hmm. Roswell, right? And that was just, and there wasn't even television back then. That was just, you know, newspapers and radios. And people were, I mean, the Pentagon had to walk that back really, really quickly. So if 1960, you, you all of a sudden, it's like, yeah, by the way, you live in a snow globe. <laughs> How's that going to go? How's that going to work? I mean, people are going to be like, no, seriously, I do, what? And so... No, it's fear, fear of um, losing the whole thing. Now, if information is power, could they use that to their advantage? Yeah, but it's a short, it's a short meeting. You know, you have that meeting. It's like, okay, we're not going to tell anyone until we can figure out how to use it, you know, to our, to our benefit. And I think we were kind of shoulder tapped to start that off. Meaning right now, I mean, you've got the narrative. You've got everything you need for it right now. You've got social media, you've got high-speed internet, and you've got six billion smartphones. You can push any narrative you want, and people will, will go for it. So now if you want to spin Flat Earth in a certain direction, you probably could do that. I just don't know what it would be. Um, 
so let's get your take on a few things here. Uh, what really happened in Antarctica? And uh, do you think Admiral Byrd has controlled opposition? Or do you trust his, what, he, what he was saying on the... Uh, the no, no, I think... No, Admiral Byrd was, was the real freaking deal. He was, he was, was kind of like John Glenn. He was a freaking Boy Scout. I mean, youngest ad, I mean, pure military all the way. Now, and shoulder tapped to be... You know, remember, he was shoulder tapped in the 20s. The 20s, right? American military... Our, our, system wasn't that refined back in the 20s we barely even had radio back then and they sent him to antarctica to just fly around with better and better planes for 30 years and then he started realizing what he was he was like the guy he was like the explorer and people wanted to talk to him so every couple of years he'd go on television and or you know even before that he was before he was doing radio before that he was he was very comfortable with the media too comfortable and that that last interview that he did before on the on the long jeans chronoscope before he did operation deep freeze was really i think the the tipping point for them for the but the powers that be because remember if you watch that and listen to it closely he was giving away stuff that he shouldn't have had the part that he was even even caught himself he's like yeah there's probably uranium down there that's that, that's should. what I, I, that's what makes me a little suspicious though because he was already like an admiral or whatever at the time so he's such a high-ranking guy and he's on this long tv show you don't think they would have had somebody just yank him off if he went too far you no because it, it back then th he was still saying everything he should have said and he didn't remember uh -huh. this was operation deep before operation deep freeze they didn't know for sure now which is why i think they were not he was not going to get allowed to do other interviews after after operation deep freeze meaning remember back in 1954 when they, when he did the long jeans chronoscope they didn't know anything yet that was only the next year when they got down there it's like oh boy yeah this isn't good and then, I mean, a guy like that, you know, they probably went to him. And it's like, okay, so you're not going to say anything, right? Right? And this is a guy that it's, it's not that they didn't trust him. It's like, uh, he's just too comfortable. He's going to slip. He's going to slip and it's, and it's going to, it's not going to go badly or it's going to go badly. So he has a heart attack, mysterious heart attack uh, a year later in 57. That was it. No, I don't think it was controlled opposition because he didn't need to be yet. You know, uh -huh. they, they, they just needed a guy. Remember, it was like, it's, it's saying something. When you shoulder tap a guy and say, just fly around in the snow for 30 years, that's saying something. And it's like, oh, yeah, we'll bring you in every once in a while to, to debrief. Okay. And, and so whatever, whatever happened down there made them fast track the, the, the Apollo programs and want to fake space and all of this. So obviously, yeah. uh, let's get into based off of things you've researched, maybe things you've heard from Bird and other things and whatever. Yeah. I mean, what do you what do you think they found uh, down in Antarctica? There's so many stories. And I your mean, face almost... is invisible. You, you're almost you're almost dead. You're you're half ghost again. <laughs> oh crap. How'd that happen? Oh, cuz the lights dying. Please don't die on my show tonight. Oh shit. Ah. How is this <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Okay, hopefully, hopefully, yeah. If I do it again, just just tell me. Oh my I god! Did it again, I did it again. What the uh, hell is going on? No, let me let me do that. Hopefully, well, let me know. If you need, okay. okay. So, Antarctica. What do you think that? Okay, so Antarctica. So you got to uh, remember. Uh, you got you got to back up a little bit. Uh, the end of during World War II, there was only one country in Antarctica, which was uh, Nazi Germany. And I absolutely believe that Indiana Jones was not just a movie. Uh, it was a wonderful, you know, the, the Germans were willing to do it. it the, the old saying is all fair in love and war. The Germans were willing to do anything to win the war. If Frodo's freaking ring was in a box somewhere, they were going to find it. If Harry Potter's wand was somewhere, they were going to find it. And if in this case, if there was something weird in Antarctica, they were going to find it. So while everyone's fighting in World War II, the Germans had a pretty big contingency down in, in German or down in Antarctica. So right after uh, the Japanese surrendered, Bird got on, you know, Operation High Jump and, you know, full blown carrier fleet, the whole nine yards, 5000 troops and goes down there and supposedly is rooting out the last of the Nazi bases. Whatever happened after after they landed is just speculation the story that i like the most is that the germans uh, the, the story i like the most is that the germans 
ran into an, an older civilization, an advanced civilization down there, and asked them for asylum. Mm -hmm. And they were granted asylum, but the condition was, well, you're not coming back. It's like a junior high dance. Once you leave the gymnasium, you can't get back in. Mm -hmm. So that was that was it. They couldn't get back in, and the, the U.S. suffered some losses, you know, in, in trying to force the issue. And but, but what the reason why I say that is because whatever happened during Operation High Jump, eight years by the time eight years later rolled around, and Admiral Byrd was on television doing the interviews, he'd already been down there for quite a while, and whatever pro the problem was 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 resolved. There was there was no problem anymore. I mean, it, Antarctica was open. There was a whole bunch of different countries that were down there doing their thing. So, is it possible the Germans were down there? Could, could they have been rooted out? Um, possibly, but if they were rooted out, the, the Americans would want to take credit for it. So whatever happened with to the Germans down there, the, that was a complete media blackout. What, whatever happened to them down there. So what? But what we found, if what we found in Operation Deep Freeze, in my opinion, was the outer marker, you know, or at least the beginning of the outer marker. Meaning, mm -hmm. you got to a stage, you got to the stage where there was, you know, you you know thousands of miles inland it took you 30 years to find it where there was some sort of barrier whatever that barrier is made of don't know there's all sorts of different options uh but that was it at that point you've got you've got some decisions to make which is you've got to seal off antarctica which is what they did immediately and you know the antarctic treaty on only unbroken treaty in the world and then again coincidentally the antarctic treaty and the van allen radiation belts are announced in the same year Mm -hmm. So you're sealing off the upper edge and the outer edge, and you just militarized space in 58 with NASA. Brilliant. All the way around. And these were moves that I, I absolutely would have done back then because you just can't, you just can't take the chance. You, they lucked out with Antarctica because it's just a, a horrible place. People don't do well down there. So, and then with space, well, nobody owns rocket ships, so worked out. All right. Um, what I wanted to ask you next, what about the North Pole? Do you think there's significance at the North Pole? Well, let me, let me stop here before we get into this. I just want to state to everybody that, like, uh, there's times when we come out and we say this is a proof of this, this is a proof of that. Right now, this is a, an awakening interview of Marx that we're two hours and 20 minutes into. And uh, I say that speculation is great when stated as such. And yeah. let's speculate on some of your, uh, some of your favorite theories on, on Flat Earth. And we're not saying that any of this is fact. I should stick it out at first. Do you think there's an Iron Republic, lands beyond, uh, that type of stuff? Do you believe in some of those? I do, stories? but I don't know if it's actually called the Iron Republic. I mean, do I think there's lands beyond? Oh, yeah. Sure. Why, why wouldn't there be? I mean, the, you, this is not going to be a one-off. There's going to be other continents out there. Um, do we have access to them? Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's a great story. I love the story. I love the story so much because it seems very, very feasible. In fact, it seems more feasible once you get into flat Earth. So, do I believe that he he caught? A, is there possible other continents out there in different states of technological advancement? Sure, sure. Why not? What do you think about the North Pole? What do you think, said? Do you think it? it I think whatever they found at the North, something significant, although much, much smaller compared to the Antarctic is it, whatever they found at the North Pole cemented the idea that they should go to the South, you know, to the, to the Antarctic because whatever they found was concrete enough that it must have resonated with the old maps, you know, the, the old maps they had. It's like, okay, well, now that we know that's real, whatever that is, you know, if it's Mount Maru, that's one, that's one thing. Um, you know, if it's a hole to the center and that's what creates the aurora, whatever, that's, that might be fine too. But that's why, you know, because again, I always thought it was interesting. That's how I got into this was that Admiral Byrd went to the North Pole first in 26. And then whatever he found there, you would have thought, wow, you know, old journals like, oh, journey to the center of the earth. He's just going to keep going to the North Pole. It's like, no, the military says, oh, no, 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 no. You're going to the South. <laughs> no one. And there was another story. I'll give you another real quick story. A lot of people don't know this one, which is um, Charles Lindbergh, same sort of era, you know, huge American hero. He supposedly, you know, there was a kind of a rivalry there. He supposedly went, followed and went to the North Pole himself and took shots, took, took snapshots, you know, with the wife. And, you know, and, and it's like, oh, yeah, it's, and, and went to the government. And the story goes that he went to the government and said, we got to tell people. And the government's like, yeah, no, we're not telling anybody. It's like, what the hell? And then shortly afterwards, coincidentally or not, was the whole Lindbergh baby thing. 
and what, it went. What's your recollection of the Lindbergh baby thing? What what happened with that? Well, the, you know, it was a hostage situation that that went badly. It was a it was a kidnapping that went south, and the baby ended up dead. But what was more interesting was that his reaction, his reaction was to renounce America and leave and go to Europe and never come back. He was like, screw you guys, which kind of you would kind of link up with the whole North Pole thing, which was, you know, if you went to him and said, you know, again, leverage, it's care to the stick. It's like, don't do it. It's like, it's like, what are you going to do? I'm a national hero. It's like, oh, we can do plenty. No, everyone's got everyone's got pressure points. So, I thought that was an Early, interesting one. Earlier, you brought up uh, the seventy mile wide eclipse, and yeah. we we're talking about that a little bit. Yeah, uh, this this theory is out there about what causes eclipse. Is the moon like uh, you know eclipse in itself? Is there a Rahu and a K two? Is there you know there's the, you, you know what the different fake takes are out there? What is yours? What do you lean towards? And again, I I, I'm not saying I lean. We know. I'm yeah, I'm not saying that I know. I will lean with what Mike Mike Helmick contacted me right after the eclipse. And he was very adamant about it, very enthusiastic about it. And he goes, and I I'm pretty sure I put the video out on, on my channel where he says, he goes, Mark, nothing is eclipsing the sun. And I go, What do you mean? He goes, I goes, I've got I've got it open in different Photoshop things. He goes, he goes, the sun is eclipsing itself. Mm-hmm. He goes. It's. He goes. There's nothing there. He goes. There's no physical object that's moving in front of the sun. He goes. It's. It's. It's like it's shading itself. And I go. That would make some sort of sense mechanically, because that's what you know what we would do if we were going to simulate it. You know, we. It's one of the few things we don't do in planetariums. We don't do the sun. We do do the moon. But that's exactly mm-hmm. what we do. When we do a moon eclipse. It's not that an object is passing in front of the moon in a planetarium. We're just eclipsing the moon. We're eclipsing the moon with its own software. And back, in yeah. fact, before software, we were doing it physically. So yeah. that's why my, my take on it. Yeah, sure. Now, yeah. is there an object that goes close to it? Sure, why not? Sync it up, sure. You bet. But uh, that's not, if you were going to fake it, that's how you would do it. You wouldn't actually put the object in front of the other object because weird things could happen. And by the way, going down that road, I mean, all the, the fun coincidences, the fact that the moon fits perfectly in front of the sun, coincidentally, yeah. because it's 400 times more narrow, but 400 times closer than the sun. That's brilliant. Con- con- and the same object is also perfectly locked in to where we don't, it doesn't even change a quarter of a degree in hundreds and hundreds of years. We only see the exact same side of the moon. I'm not saying that's that's lazy design, but it's, uh, or, or is it done deliberately as a breadcrumb? I don't know. Do you think that the moon is a solid object? Maybe. Maybe. It's tough. It's it's a tough one because there, there's so much in the sky we don't know. Yeah, about and we can't. And I, I always hated when in the beginning days of Flat Earth, people would say, oh, the sun's 3,400 miles away and all this. It's like right. you're just running with numbers again that people gave you and things that we can't prove. But right. yeah, I, 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 I mean, mean towards it's probably not solid. It doesn't appear to be to me. It doesn't. It doesn't have to be. In fact, no. one of one of my um, somebody else came came to me a couple of years ago and said the sun doesn't even have to be a three dimensional object. I mean, think about when you take a magnifying glass and you magnify a point of light on the ground. Think of how bright that point is. It's in fact that point is so bright you can burn things with it. Well, mm-hmm. what if the original light that's creating you know is is coming from somewhere else? What if the sun is just a pinpoint? If, if it's just a, it's a condensed ray of light. Hard to say. We're, we're, there's a lot of stuff going on in the sky we don't know. But one day we'll figure it out. We just don't have the tech to do it yet. I mean, you got to remember that, that um, hell, we didn't even have HD technology a couple decades ago. So, uh, obviously, neither one of us think that there's actually people on a space station. We already discussed that. Hollywood trickery no. and whatnot. Zero G planes. Right. Stuff shot in the studio computer graphics but do you think that there's something that is flying up there that people are tracking and if so what is it sure um do i think it's one of uh, david weiss's saddle probably you know one of those little things that i love the, the that was a thread that we pulled on that i was so glad that we did that we found out that you know the nasa is the largest consumer of helium in the world and probably the largest producer as well um and the fact that they can lift if you can do, if you're releasing satellites that are that are eight thousand pounds, that's four tons. Why in the world are you doing sending anything up on a rocket? That means the rockets are just for show. 
So if you can launch, if you can load an eight ton object up there, eight tons you can do a lot with eight tons. I mean, you could make something that's that's fairly long and fairly yeah. bright. Sure, why not? Can we backtrack to something we brought up earlier? There was a little confusion maybe about what you said. What was your take on the uh, 24 hour Antarctic sun? Because to me, I haven't seen proof of that, and I've only seen uh, fake. I've only seen fakery of that. Do you believe that there yeah, is one? Yeah, I could go either way because I've talked to photographers that swear to me that that they're there. I mean, not. I mean, these guys are fairly objective. They're not. You know, these are these are fairly normal guys. So, but does that necessarily mean anything? No, I know that David and Jaron and, and other guys, you know, they've done the whole missing footage thing. Great, wonderful. Maybe that's it. But if it's not it, then there's a then there's a second light source, which again is not that big a deal because there's lots of stuff going on in the sky that we you know can't figure out. I mean, there's stuff. I still think there's stuff that's instanced in the sky, meaning there's multiple versions based on region, which is what mm -hmm. we do in our simulations. What when we design things. So when you're looking at the belt of Orion where you are, and I'm looking at the belt of Orion where I am, we both think we're looking at the same stars, but we're actually not. We're looking at, at different versions of them that are just individually for us because we can't be in two places at the same time. But I don't know, maybe. What about um, what's what if I say a couple words? So you give me your opinion. SpaceX and Starlink. Uh, first of all, what, what do you think the agenda of SpaceX is? I, I tell people I think the whole reason they did SpaceX is people losing, you know, kind of interest in NASA. It kind of spices it up a yep. little. And if they need a scapegoat, they can pin yep. it on either one of, one of the two and have the other continue with whatever they need to do. Yep. SpaceX is a distraction. It also keeps the private sector from getting into it. The whole One of the big reasons why the military took over space and ran it for decades it wasn't until way later before Amazon and Virgin and, and SpaceX is because you don't want the private companies involved because you, you need to control the, the narrative. Um, one of the scariest, again, remember, NASA is just a collection of parts, right? They get all their parts from, I don't know, Lockheed Martin and General Dynamics and Boeing and all these other guys. And you don't want those guys, the military contractors, to all of a sudden team up with somebody else like Frito-Lay and Boeing get together. And it's like, yeah, let's put a banner on the moon. Let's do this. Yeah, you don't you don't ever, ever, ever want that. So SpaceX, I mean, Virgin Galactic went nowhere. I mean, think of all the crashes and the explosions and stuff these yeah. guys have had, yeah. right? And Blue Horizons, like, oh, I'm going to go straight up and straight down. And then um, SpaceX is the closest you've got to a, a private space program, but they're running off of NASA facilities. That's the part that, again, people don't get. It's like, why are you using military facility, our U.S. military facilities for your launches? You're in direct competition with NASA, and you're using Kennedy? <laughs> Seriously? You're using these? And you're landing on their pads? What? And you're, you're delivering stuff directly to the ISS? How? How, is this, how are you not conflicting directly with that? I mean, when Amazon took over the post office, Congress lost their freaking minds. But when... SpaceX is delivering stuff on a regular basis to the ISS? Oh, no, that's perfectly fine. So what are you talking about? He's not even American. Uh, it's, no, no. SpaceX, sorry, you, you asked me the first question. What, uh, my, what, my first thought, SpaceX, and what was the other thing? Uh, Starlink. What, what's going on with Starlink? Oh, are they Starlink. Really who, who the hell cares? Lights in the sky. I don't care what they're doing. It may be, it's probably military. Whatever it is, they're making it seem like it's like it's just, oh, yeah, it's part of a, a system. Find me somebody that's using Starlink on a regular basis. Tell me, tell me what they're using. As far as SpaceX goes, once I saw that freaking Roadster in space, everything was, was <laughs> shot to hell. Listen, that I, was, use that, yes. I use that to flat smack people so much, like especially uh, the last two years because of how absurd the Rona thing is. Uh, even the people that you know, believe some of the fear and it came from a Wuhan lab or, you know, this type of stuff. At least they know right. there's enough lies out there. They're so fed up with the lies and the inconsistencies in the media. They're kind of willing to listen to this type of stuff. I, I yeah. my, my kick, my door in is I go, so what do you think about the car in space? And, and a lot of people, uh, they don't need to know. You, then you show them and it's like, this is what you believe. I just think it's so ridiculous, dude. Oh, you know, the car in space was horrible on all levels and they knew it was horrible they it, it seemed to be an experiment of again of how, what can we get away with it because remember in social media you can track this stuff in real time and you can see what's resonating there was too many people that are doing hashtag fake hashtag not buying it hashtag you suck um the the big one was the um for me was the branding or lack thereof 
That was the giveaway for me. Was it wasn't the three perfect cameras. Now this thing was spinning around and having perfect transmission. No, 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 no. The part was you've got a public company and a private company. You've got Tesla and SpaceX, and there were no logos on the car or the guy at all. That thing should have been wall-to-wall -wall advertising. Um, in fact, it was Patricia, the, the one that brought it up to me. She goes, she goes, why isn't that a big banner in every Tesla dealership in the world? And I go, yeah, you're absolutely right. Why wouldn't it? It's the only car that's ever been in space. In fact, why didn't Chevy or Ford or anybody else do, you know, the, the, put a car in space and put a big banner on it and do something fun in space? It's because it, it never, ever happened. It was a, it was a no go. No one even no one wants to talk about it. You know they just twirled it around for a little bit. It's like oh we're sending it off to Mars, so we're gonna cut transmission. It's like what? How? What? Why? What? And and it wasn't even the flagship. And why would it have been a convertible? And oh my God, it was just awful. Just but again, it didn't get that much traction because they just pulled it out of the media. Which is why I think there weren't any brands on the cars. Why didn't you have a big sign on the side of it that said Tesla? Or a big thing on the hood that said SpaceX. Why? Because you weren't sure if we were going to pull it off. And you really didn't. Again, why was why weren't they in the dealership? No. I, so no, are you trying to tell me that there wasn't a mannequin in the driver's seat of a car that's a convertible with no modifications done to it? Nothing's happened. The tires haven't popped. The paint hasn't melted. And it's not listening to David Bowie doing laps around the sun. A lot of people don't know that, too. They said that thing did a whole lap around the sun, dude. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Again, the the reason... Let, 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 let's back up because I know we, we, you, you've only got a couple questions or... or we only have so much time, but I want to mention this real quick. Well, the I, I reason can go why... however long. I, we can go. Well, no, 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 no. It's fine. What, so. However you want to ask, but I got to get this point out, which is yeah. the reason why NASA gets away with it, gets away with all the stuff they get away with is because the average person in America, the average person that goes through our education system is taught barely anything. They're taught just enough to get by. And then it's like, get your driver's license and then get out of here. The... They are taught almost nothing about physics or engineering or biology or microbiology or any of that stuff. So they, you're right. When you see the Tesla Roadster in space at face value, oh, yeah, look at that. It's kind of cool. If you know anything about physics, it's like, yeah, that car should have been just a freaking mess. You know, it should have been just destroyed. It was absolutely pristine. So what, what the hell happened? Uh, no, one, no one goes into it because the average person is the same reason the moon missions. Had got away with what they got away with. The soft spacesuit for me was one of the biggest cons ever. No one yet, no scientist yet has ever told me, and I, I challenge anybody, anybody from like Professor Dave to Simon Dan to any of those clowns, which is tell me what magical thing is in that backpack for these guys in 1968 on the moon that stops the vacuum of space from ripping that suit apart and those guys dying. Tell, tell me what happens there. And no, no one ever can do it. It's like, it's like, well, it's like a scuba tank. It's got heating and cooling. It's air and nitrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. It's like, I don't care about any of that. The soft suit, anything soft in a vacuum will completely pressurize up until it turns into a basketball. Why didn't the space suit become a basketball? No one, no one will ever, ever, ever talk about it. Find me. Some, somebody email me. Somebody, somebody from the science committee. Tell me what stops that space suit from, from becoming a basketball. Yeah. Anyone. Anyway, and you, you've 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 offered to put you've offered to put yourself in a vacuum chamber in a spacesuit. I did, I did, and and that and no one ever even came close. No one ever did that, and that was one of the the biggest biggest things for me. Which is again, it was a brilliant. If you watch, it's not secret footage. If you watch the early NASA footage from the early fifties when they were designing the spacesuits, they were all plastic and metal and clunky. They couldn't do anything, and. They realize it's like, we can't fake this. You know how big the ship would have to be? It's like, how are these guys even going to get in it? And then some guy, brilliant guy, says, you know what? He, he rolls the dice. He goes, we'll just put him in a soft suit. No one's going to know. No one knows anything about physics. They'll buy it. We'll just put it on TV. And I'll be damned if that wasn't the case. Meaning when I... When I when I was doing flatter stuff outside of America, that was one of the first questions I asked people, which was I said... I get the Americans have to believe in the space program, rah, rah, wave the flag, we're the greatest. Why do you in Europe, why do you in other countries, why do you believe that the Americans went to the moon? And they all say the exact same thing. They say, well, What's because that? it was on t TV. Oh, God. And it's like, because the Americans would never lie about anything on television ever? 
But that's that's the reason why. So what? And the, then they follow up. It's like, well, yeah, but the news wouldn't lie. It's like, uh, oh my god. <laughs> yeah, I was like, okay, I I get it, I get that's it. And ter- that's terrible. Anyway, but that's that's the reason why the 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 American education system does very very little to cr- create quest critical thinking. How's that? Oh, they do. Completely, we, we no, you, you're completely discouraged from it. You're not allowed to challenge what they're teaching you. There's no critical no. thought. It's just just regurgitation straight down the line, right. man. That's it. And you get regur- you get rewarded for remembering and regurgitating, not for thinking outside the box, which is the exact opposite of what you should be doing. Yep. True. Yeah. How about we take five minutes and come back? Is that cool? One sure. more quick break. Come. Sure. You still got a little bit of time. Is that good? Yeah. Yeah, I got a little bit of time. Sure. All right. Cool. We'll take a quick break, guys. Don't go anywhere. Just need a five-minute bathroom break. I'll be right back. Mark Sargent, My Awakening, episode number 75. All right, everyone. Real quick before we stop back with the interview, let me just uh, tell you guys about a meetup I have coming up. There is going to be a meetup in Charlotte on June 11th. We're going to have a meetup on Saturday night, like next Saturday. Not this Saturday, but next Saturday, 7.30 p.m. at a place called Room and Board in Charlotte in the Noda District. Uh... It's going to be a really good time. So if anybody is going, just email me so I can get a head count. Ricefoot at gmail.com. And I am back with Mark. Thank you, brother. I'm appreciating the show tonight. Really good. Hey. Um, so if we start, if you start to get into a crunch for time and we need, we got like, you know, down to 15 or 20 minutes, just give me a warning so I can start to, you know, wind it down. But I do have some more things I want to ask you if you're cool. Okay. Going for a we got longer. All right. Uh, so we have a, a, a we have a lot of things in common. I think one of the things you have in common that I have in common is we. Uh, and I'm not trying to you know pump anybody's ego, yours or mine, but we both are kind of leading voices for uh, you know certain topics. Uh, you with flat Earth, me with Mandela Effect. We both do shows where we take live calls. Actually, we both do a show with Karen B as well. I have to take those live calls. Um, what what has that meant for you? Like, because it's really big for me. I've been doing this for 12 years. Not on YouTube, but podcasts with call-in shows and being able to connect with the community. What has that meant to you to be able to have these people reach out to you and tell you like how much you, you've helped them, how much you've meant to them, and, and to be able to keep that open line of communication with, uh, with people like that? Because I think it's huge. Well, I think it's, gr- it's great, but it wasn't what I intended. That's the weird part. Um, when I was doing this, it was mostly for a peace of mind when I, when I started started out, you know, and, and like that first year, I was basically holding my breath because I, I really wasn't sure where I was going to go. And I thought there must there must be something out there that, that shuts the whole thing down because people were, were, again, like long distance photography I had nothing. I knew nothing about it. Um, but when people email me and they say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm so glad, you know, you changed my life and you opened my mind and red pilled me and, and all the other things. And they share part of their journey. It's wonderful. And I try to email back as many people as I can. Um, and I try to call back as many people as I can, but it's, I have to do some filtering because there's some people that just get into it, you know, like they'll listen to like clue one or clue two, and they'll, they'll, they'll be calling me just because I, I can hear, hear my voice in the background because I told them to in the clues. Mm-hmm. And so I have to let them kind of go part of their journey on their own. It, it's 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 kind of nerve wracking for me because I want some people to you know I want them I want them to go a certain way, but I want it to happen naturally. the The reason why the community has done so well is because everybody tore down the globe their own way, their own special way. You know that's why we have such a high retention rate because they you know if you're the one that tore down the globe, how can you go back to it? Which is very matrix like. You know, we, I didn't, I didn't tear it down for you. You did that yourself. So no, it's, it's, it's fun. There's been some, I've gotten to do, let's put it this way. Would I have changed anything? No. Um, I've gotten to do some fun, fun stuff because of this, but I'm not doing, I'm not in it for any sort of popularity or anything like that. I am just, I, I love, I, I want to find as many critical thinkers as I can. And I want to help develop as many critical thinkers as I can. And the only way to do that is, is naturally for me. You know, I can't, I can't ram it down their throats and I just, you know, but that put, put the seed in their head, see if it happens. And if it happens, great. If it doesn't wonderful. And if I, you know, and they want to give me credit for it. Wonderful. You know, I, I can tell you though, you know, as far as the community goes, I am, 
you know, I don't even have, I think I'm, I'm even in the top 10 as far as subs goes. I mean, I've gotten to do some fun things, but uh, there's a lot of other people that I, I think were more influential. But no, I anyway. wouldn't say too many. I wouldn't say too many more. Well, I mean, <laughs> you'd, be, what, you'd, but... be, you'd be, and I don't want to alienate anybody, but you would be in those, if there was just a handful of, uh, just one handful, you would definitely be in that handful. Uh, well, along with a couple other people. I mean, I, I got to do what what I liked. You've you've heard me say this before, which is I'm not kidding you when I when you, it's because people say, what's your role? What's your role? It's like, well, I'm, I'm the freshman recruiter and I don't mind. I don't mind being that I go. If you get into Flat Earth, there's a high degree of probability that the first the 101 book was me. You know, it was going through me. But then you went on to other things. I can't tell you how many people have talked to me and said, yeah, I used to listen to your stuff, but now I'm into such and such. You know, like it's it's very, very university-like where you have third-year students talking to first-year mm -hmm. students like, oh, yeah, I was into him. But now I'm into such, you know, I'm now I'm into this guy, which is which is fine. I mean, my, my, my role was to make it easy. The reason why Eric, it, we'll use Eric, great example. A lot of people, because I, I got this many, many, many times, which is Eric released his stuff, but it went over the heads of a bunch of people, a bunch. It wasn't simple enough. It wasn't easy. It was definitely a second year book, maybe even a third year in terms of content. And then people ran into my stuff. They, they kind of, you know, baby stepped them through it. It's like, oh yeah, here's A, B, plus B, plus C. And then so people would say, Oh yeah, I used to be in, I didn't really get Eric's stuff, but then I listened to your stuff, but then I got into Eric's stuff afterwards. Yeah. Like, eh, all right, I'll take that. <laughs> it's fine. I, but I don't mind. It's, it's a cool thing, you know, to do, to, to get people in through the door. You know, again, if you, if you know anything about universities, the freshman recruiter is very apt. You know, they, it's like, oh yeah, over here, we got the music department. We tear down NASA over there. Here's experiments over here. Have fun. Go at it. You never see that guy again. Yeah. So. So I'm sure your uh, your mom and the rest of your family is used to you throwing every conspiracy out there for fucking ever. But uh, what do they think about you being like one of the faces of flat Earth? And what do they think about the material? What do they think about the topic? when when I was in Colorado? Uh, I called I called my mother who was in Seattle, and I said because I, I wrote the clues in in Colorado, and I said uh, just so you know it. it if you're online, if you're not scouring the internet, it's one thing. But if you're doing interviews, sooner or later, people are going to run into it, right? So I had to warn my family. Once I started doing the first, after like the first 10 interviews, which were fairly small podcasts, I had to start, I had to tell people, say, okay, you might be hearing some things and just, just kind of brace yourself for it i'll explain it later but right now just be aware that i haven't lost my mind and i haven't joined a cult and um they they were actually okay with it i mean you gotta remember the, the fireworks thing they had to deal with before and, and the video game stuff they had to deal with i've never never gone down the well-traveled path so no, they they were in the i was lucky they were fine now if i was married oh good lord i don't even know what would happen there oh yeah well I oh mean, in fact, I don't in fact know. my but my last girlfriend who moved it, she became a, <laughs> she became a full blown psychiatrist out in Indiana. Uh, I, she actually was thinking of doing a, a thesis on me, a paper, like a published thing. And I go, wh why aren't you? Right. And she goes, well, she goes, I lived with you for five years. And she goes, I think that's going to come up and it's not going to go well with my peer group. And it's like, ah, crap. So, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Anyway. All right. Let me ask you about two other topics and then we'll start to, uh, I'll ask you if you maybe a couple, not too personal, but a couple personal life questions and then okay. we'll start to wind this down. Uh, so the first time I met you in person was actually Karen's first event, the first flat Toberfest, which a lot of people don't even know about. They think the second is the first, but the first right. one was at that place called the firmament. And, uh, right. we ended up, we ended up renting that, uh, Airbnb house. Remember with yeah, the guy that um, had the guy, the guy that had the kilo of cocaine stashed in his race car. We thought. <laughs> yeah, the de big, big daddy, big daddy Don's. Was that his name? Yeah, the 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 race car, the drag racer. Yeah. Yeah. So I got to talk to you uh, about one of my favorite topics, the Mandela effect. We got to speak about it in the basement while we were shooting pool and a few right. other times. And I also right. was interesting. 
in January of last year, you gave an interview. It was a Flat Earth Interview 317. Um, and the guy started the interview by asking you, like, it was really weird, just out of left field. He was like, I want to ask you uh, what you think about the Mandela effect. And then you went on for a little bit. You talked about uh, Dolly's braces. You talked about Ed McMahon. Uh, yep. He asked if you believed it. Uh, you said, yeah. Uh, you still in the same position? Because the other night, you didn't really sound like you were... Uh, so on board anymore and also oh no 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 no. i i absolutely am it's just that for a lot of there's there's only so much i can do meaning um meaning again unless you can record to video then you know the human mind you'll never be able to compare people's perception of, of things and it's like and we've done it in science fiction which is great but we can't do it here so it only go it only goes so far but do i believe in it oh yeah you bet i do why, why wouldn't you? I mean, the, the, the great line from the Matrix, you know, the black cat thing was thrown in there for a very good reason, which was like, look, things, things in places like this. Now, the question is, is it done deliberately as sort of a breadcrumb or is it just an overlapping? There was a thing I like to tell people is like there was a, a this is a great example of it where there was a word document back in the day back in the early 2000s right that i i always use for my notes and i use the same mm-hmm. freaking document over wrote, over, over wrote it wrote it wrote it saved it wrote it and after i don't know a couple hundred times it started doing spooky stuff weird stuff there was formatting that was happening that shouldn't happen there's a lot of things in computers that still should not be happening even decades later and so it could there be stuff like that happening here sure you bet. I, I wouldn't wouldn't question it for a second. And the Dolly thing was one of the biggest for me, because it didn't make sense if it wasn't. That yeah. you know, I you you follow the story, and it's like the only person Jaws would fall for is her because she's cute with huge braces. That's the only reason he would fall for. Her. There's no reason for he to he to be attracted to her at all, and there wouldn't be this kindred spirit at all. He'd just be this scary Frankenstein monster. That, that was that was the the you know, one one of the gl- most glaring for me because it, you know you have something to back it up with, you know what yeah. I mean? Did you mirror did you mirror, know that? mirror or magic mirror or Berenstein yeah. or Berenstein or, you know? Did anyway. you know that Ed McMahon Ed McMahon's from my hometown? Did you know that? Did not know that. <laughs> Ed McMahon is from Lowell, Massachusetts. Yes, yeah. absolutely. So, but, uh, but yeah, go ahead. What else? Continue. But the the other thing that muddies the waters real quick would be um the uh you have other things deliberately that that just just happened to muddy the waters like uh demolition man the 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 yeah the, that's a that's a national that's a country brand. yeah that's a national uh, thing which is for the people that are listening taco bell yeah. won the corporate wars in the american version but pizza hut won the corporate wars outside of america so you got two different you know versions of the same yeah 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 that that that's not a mandela effect but some people did think that it was in fact Joshua had asked me that at Flat Toberfest, uh, yeah. authentic intent. He had asked me if that was. I said I hadn't heard of that. And then when you look at it, it's just that is. It's real. Just a, uh, yeah. That's just a branding thing. So um, let me ask you this though: when you when I heard you give that interview, and I don't want to sit here, and we don't have to go down like your biggest Mandela effects or anything. I'm glad that yeah. you recognize it. I already knew that you recognized it, and uh, you know, because we had talked about it personally three three years ago, face to face. But what I wanted to ask you, and you have a view on what this reality might be, and I do like to tell people, like, I think that a lot of these changes come from the creator. I do say I'm open to other ideas. Uh, Some people think it's CERN. Some people think we're in a simulation. Some people think it's Satan. And you are a guy that's kind of a simulation guy, and, you you know, you brought that up, that this would all work if we were in a simulation. And uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts. I'd like to hear your thoughts on simulation theory for... A few minutes if we could because i don't really sure, have anybody sure. that interesting to explain ha- me the, their ideas on it happy to do it um i did a video and it's on my channel called um how virtual reality could work on a flat earth and because i came from you know i played video games for a living and i you know became a video game producer for a short amount of time every video game that's made out there is made on a flat box world uh, that's it. I mean, from the outside, it's like, oh, no, it's this world or that world. It's no, it's it's made flat because they want to make it easy and no one's going to know anyway. It's like you make it absolutely, but you know, the level, the edge is level. Yeah, there might be some hills and valleys, but it's it's made in a box. In fact, the sky is not a dome. It's a freaking box. It's called a skybox system. Um, 
when it comes to this world, there were some two movies, of course, that stick out. One of the, is The Matrix. The other one is The 13th Floor, which I loved in, even more because it was based on an earlier um, movie from the 1970s called World on a Wire that was done in Germany, which was based on a 60s book, which is called Simulcron 3. Mm -hmm. Which, but the whole thing revolves around that if you're in the simulation, you don't know it, obviously, because you're in of it. Of course. Yeah. Right? But when you get to the stage of your technology where you can create a simulation that is so close to this that you wouldn't be able to tell the difference, that's when everything falls apart. Which is why I don't think we're ever going to get it. Our, our corporations are loving to run towards that. We, that's our ultimate goal, and it always ends badly. There was a wonderful quote by... Um, the guy that created the Dilbert comic strips back in the day, you know, Dilbert mm -hmm. and Dogbert. Um, <clears throat> he didn't have a lot to go off of back then, but he goes, he goes, look, he goes, let's face it. He goes, the last invention that we'll ever make is the holodeck, you know, like from Star Trek Next Gen. He goes, he goes, he goes I don't even know why anyone goes even further, because once you create the holodeck, no one wants to do anything else. Why would you do anything else? You would just be li people lining up and, and have holodecks in installed in their homes. So, but when it comes to the simulation, I, people should look at two things. One is a double slit experiment, and it, that gets tied into video games. Double slit experiment says that whatever's happening over there, if I'm not looking at it, is not being drawn in complete high definition because I'm not looking at it. The observer changes it. And you're saying, why does that matter? Because we we do that in video games when we in simulations when we create them it's called flashlight graphics whatever's in front of you we're drawing it whatever's behind you doesn't exist because it doesn't have to exist so you're saying what does that got to do with anything it's like why is that happening here in our world and again watch the 13th floor things that we are creating in our simulations are being mimicked here in this world the double slit experiment is a great example of that. And I know science is like, well, it's repeatable, so it's science. It's like, yeah, it's freaking magic by comparison. And, you know, the observer, you know, the cat is both alive and dead at the same time, particles and waves, blah, blah, blah. But the other thing that I thought was even more interesting, and I don't want to I don't want to drag it out too much, which is something called neuroscience and free will. Brilliant. And we didn't come up with this. It, science did. Science came up with it. There's some wonderful videos on it where they hooked up electrodes to people's brains and they put a computer screen in front of them. And they said, okay, pick a number between one and nine and, and note the time. And, you know, we're going to monitor your brain waves. And also note before you hit the keystroke, if there's any delay between the time you think about it and the time you hit the keystroke, note that, right? Most of the time it was instant, though. It's like, what, mm -hmm. what number between one and nine? Ready? Go. Three, click, three. Here's where it gets weird. The computer registered that you made the decision to click the keyboard eight seconds before you clicked it. It's not that it knew what number you were gonna pick, but it knew that you were going to pick a number eight seconds ago before the question was even asked. And that just upset science to no end. And that leads into another part of the whole simulation thing, which is predestination. Science hates that, which means that maybe you're not in some sort of virtual reality. Maybe you're in a vir virtual movie, which makes more sense resource wise. Meaning if you were going to go into some sort of virtual reality, your best option is to make sure you pick, you wouldn't do it real time. No, remember, remember pre-record versus live? You make sure yeah, oh, yeah. all the decisions are picked for you ahead of time, and then you memory block out what was before that temporarily. And then you go through it, and everything works out the way it, the way it was supposed to, because you were the one that made the choices ahead of time. Anyway, it's, it's brilliant. And again, science hates it, but hey, they were the ones that created it. And, and sorry, you know what? I'll, I'll throw one more at you. The um, 100th monkey effect. You heard of that one? Probably yeah. by name only. 100th yeah, monkey course. effect also ties into it, which is um, the, the Japanese uh, monkeys on the islands with the potatoes. They drop the potatoes off the islands and they show the monkeys. It's like, oh, yeah, by the way, if you wash the potatoes off the sand, you know, the sand off the potatoes, they taste better because you're not eating sand. Right. And the monkeys are figuring this out slowly but surely. And then all of a sudden you get to about the 100th monkey for whatever reason. And all of them know it, including the ones on the islands that aren't even connected. <laughs> You go over, you fly, take a helicopter well, over to the you, other islands. So that, 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 you know, obviously that could tie into a simulation thing, or it could be there's a collective consciousness and all these beings it, it, are all, all connected. Tomato, tomato, collective consciousness or update. 
Meaning yeah. monkeys now in this area now have the ability to eat potatoes without sand. Yeah. So, you know, they don't have to they don't have to learn it. It's like apparently whatever it was authorized it was it seemed like a beneficial thing, but that's something we would do. So how yeah. about that? There you go. Yeah, good. Good good stuff. Uh, let me ask you another flat earth related question because I, I obviously you're talking about Star Trek and holodecks and uh <clears throat> I was really, I mean, I was as big as Star Wars, not as anybody. I love the original Star Trek, not so much a big fan of the other versions. Um, but, you know, has Flat Earth ruined the sci-fi movies, Out of Space and all that for you? No, not, well, any out, any outer space, I mean, really distant space, no. Because I'll just say, you know, that's, I'll, I'll just call that a, <clears throat> a separate dimension. Anything that's near Earth orbit, yeah, has wrecked it. So, like, when I was watching um, Gravity, for example, with Sandra Bullock, beautiful movie, absolutely gorgeous movie. The effects just show you what can be faked and what, what can't. Um, but at the same time, it's like, oh, yeah, it's just a, a space reinforcement movie. Um, but everything else, like Star Trek and Star Wars, I'll watch it, you know, just because it's like uh, the, the disconnect, suspension of disbelief. It's like, yeah, I'll, I'll go with it, you know, just for, for, for the story. But I see it in a different different light. It doesn't bother me. What bothers me is when I see a globe in a television show that shouldn't be there and nobody else in the room sees it but me you know it's like it's like what is that doing in frame right there why is it going to be why is it in frame for three minutes there's no reason you know people think oh it's just a random office it's like nothing's random in hollywood everything is placed in a certain you know they've got people dedicated people they just sit there and place things around so so you uh you know you you, you do strange world you 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 did it with uh What's his face before the guy from Jersey? Uh, back Jonathan in the beginning. from Jersey, yeah. yeah. Jonathan right. from Jersey. Now, obviously, you yeah. do it with uh, with Karen. You used to do Flat Earth and all the hot potatoes with Patricia, which was a, uh, you know, we don't have to spend yeah. too much time on that, but that was an excellent show. I thought it was a really good show for the community to I, come and, and listen to. I liked it too. Um, Patricia fell into the, the the social media trap, and she was warned ahead of time. Which is the 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 problem with social media is it's there's a there's a huge rating system around it, thumbs up, thumbs down, comments, subs. It's all you know. This it's a big ranking system, and she was acutely aware of it. You know the the her perception and her place in that world. And I said you can't <clears throat> you can't do that. You can't take the good the the, the good with the bad. On this because there's too much bad you know um, in her case you know she she was a triple threat um, you know attractive Jewish woman <laughs> you know making videos and you know people were aware that she was sensitive along those lines they were coming after her and they never stopped um, and it got way worse after the, the Netflix thing happened and eventually she just kind of so folded. let me that I'm glad you brought that all aspect of it up because uh... Uh, and Patricia's a friend of mine. She's been a friend of mine a long time, a long, a long, a lot longer than a lot of you guys have even known me in the uh, flat Earth community. Before I was making videos and stuff, we had we had been friends for a while. Um, mm. But so you, on the other hand, uh, have been the polar opposite of that. So for instance, like there's a whole bunch of people that run around calling each other shills. We know that that happens all the time in these communities, sure. right? Um, yeah. Then there's going to be some people like me that usually don't do that but you know somebody pisses me off enough i'll go in a rage and fire back and sometimes i shouldn't do that but sometimes i need to uh you're the type of guy that just ignores it all and you definitely have a bullseye on you and that's the approach mm. you've taken what, what what made you take that approach and do you think that's the right approach i mean i think it looks like it's worked out pretty well for you but um what do you think sanity sanity mostly um there was no way um what what a lot of people don't realize is when the clues came out and all the other people that were mirroring the clues, the comment sections were huge. I mean, they were extremely deep. And the I, I couldn't name the psychology experiments behind it, but you could read 20 great comments in a row, and then all it takes is that one comment where it's like, you suck, you're this, you're that, unsubbed, I hate you, and everything about you. And that sticks with you. And... Mm -hmm. It's tough to shake. We'll multiply that by a lot. And then you got to think, you know, the, the, people forget that it, it's just part of the Internet. I was uh, look, I'm, the reason why I don't delve into it that much. and I don't read a lot of the comments. I mean, I'll, I'll poke every once in a while just to feed the trolls every ever so sparsely. But I was there when the um, when the first forum boards came out in the 90s and 
you could almost hear people winding up when the trolls were created, when they were birthed, when it was mm -hmm. like, wait a minute, I can post anything I want and there's no repercussions right. at all. Yeah, and I can tell just, somebody that I F their mother and they don't know who yeah, I am. And... No one, yeah, no one is going to, uh, no one's going to touch me. And so, and, and my, my running gag is, is that, um, you could literally make a video. It doesn't matter what you make. It doesn't matter how careful, how lightly you tread. You can make a video about kittens and puppies playing in a children's cancer ward, right? And within a hundred hits, somebody's going to come in there. It's like a hundred thumbs up to nothing. And somebody's going to come in. It's like, this Dude, they'll sucks. Come hard, too. They'll, be like, they'll be like, your mother's the C word, like right off the bat. Yeah, dude. yeah. It's, <laughs> it's like, I'm subbed. I hate your religion. I hate your sexuality. I hate everything about you. And it's like, what the hell? Just because nobody, you know, because they're, it's like, I, I'm going to be the first guy. I'm going to be that, you know, there are people like that. So knowing that, eh, I, I mean, I'm not going to, I mean, I, I, I like my, you know, I like my self esteem to be somewhat intact. Yeah, I, I mean, that's the first thing I tell people. I, and people have asked me, it's like, oh, how do you build a challenge? It's like, first thing, don't hover well, above uh, the subs. Uh, don't. Tr uh, and, and, and I'll tell you, like, uh, with you being in the public spotlight so much because you get so, so many of the interviews, I think yeah. it's best off that you don't engage in all that shit. No, like, no, no, no. You, you can't. Don't, you don't need, you can't you don't need that it, shit out there. <clears throat> well, no, if you take it personally. Me the me if the media not... grabs if media grabs a video of you telling somebody to go fuck themselves and go on a big rant. Yeah, 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 like, yeah. I mean, I, was, I'm, was... I'm guilty of doing it sometimes, you know, but like, you know, it, if you do it, that, it's it not is, good. It is rare. Every, I mean, I snapped, I think for the first time, it had nothing to do with Flat Earth, though. It had to deal with the whole pandemic thing uh, a couple months ago mm -hmm. on an interview, which I did not put on my channel. But uh, uh, the rest of it, though, no. Pretty, you know, just try to stay the course. And again, why Why would I get upset? The, the I'm not kidding. You. It's like, look, getting upset at somebody that's getting mad about Flat Earth is silly because you would have been that guy. It would be completely hypocritical for me to do that. It's like, I can't yell at him. It's like, I would have yelled at him, but I, I just can't anymore. I'm, I'm in this place and they're in that place. And I've had people come back at me later and apologize. Very few, but they have where, where they say, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I'm into it now. I really wasn't, but now I see it. It's like, yeah, I get it. Just takes a while so so uh you're trucking along with the interviews i know that we just talked about that earlier you got over 400 of them now you have your yeah. show uh strange world every monday night yep. um are there any different type of future strategies you're trying to implement or you think we as a community could implement to change the direction fine tune a little bit that we're doing you know what, what do you think uh it depends. It really depends because I, I don't the the way the way the world is going right now. Mm -hmm. I, I it's hard to say. I mean, again, in 2019, we we could do no wrong. <laughs> we were crushing it on all fronts. I mean, when you have when you have a major late night show trying to punk you, your your conference, your American conference, and then all the conferences we were doing overseas, and I mean, everyone wanted to talk about it. And then, you know, the last couple of years, everything got shut down and quarantined and stuff like that. I, the strategies really didn't have to change because we just need to get back out there. You know, the, you know, the, once the, the mandates were lifted, we, you know, we're slowly but surely, I don't know where the rest of the world's going to go. I, I still do believe in the reset, uh, the, you know, that they're, they're committed to it. So I don't know how that's going to affect us, but I will say that we have persevered better than most. I mean, like, like for example, during um, Flattoberfest last year, um, you know, Karen threw a conference that nobody else was doing conferences, no, right? And we and we did one. We yeah, we couldn't do it in Vegas. She's done three. She's done three now. We've done three with like yeah. four hundred plus people each time. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. They're so, all I mean, thing. We we were doing things when other people didn't because we didn't buy into the narrative. Mm -hmm. So we didn't. Our strategy really hasn't changed. Didn't have to change. We we just. Uh, the the fear didn't get to us like it did other people. Well, in fact, we found ways around it, if if at all possible. So, I mean, I'm gonna go, God willing, I'm gonna go to the conference this year. So, oh, it's gonna be awesome, dude! I can't wait. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, why don't I? Uh, I'll ask you one more question, but it's a big one. And then uh, uh -huh. after that, we'll uh, we'll kind of tell people where they can find you and everything. We'll start okay. to wind this down. 
Unless there's we anything got... else. Is there any other topics we didn't touch on that you'd like to spend a few minutes on? Anything really that interests you a lot? I don't want um... to no, I mean, everything right now that I'm kind of focused on, uh, you know, when I'm doing my, the shows is mostly current events just because I'm trying to give people a heads up, uh, you know, just trying to let people know that the uh, like this next episode called it's called The Hype Machine just because the the, the one thing we've gotten really, really good at in, in the social media thing is we fine tune the media to where now you can turn people in a direction very, very easily. You can get at them so many different ways. And I'm just so happy that our community sees through that. Um, and I'm just going to try to reinforce that. So, no. No. Other awesome. than that, no. Nothing. No other All right. Let me, ask you, let me ask you the big question. Yeah. What is this place? Why are we here? And where do we go next? In your opinion. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. Um, it can only be... If you had to choose between one of three things, because it can only be one of three things. Um, it's either entertainment, which I don't necessarily buy because there's not there's a lot of people that aren't having fun. It's either confinement, like a prison. And it's like, yeah, it's pretty nice for a prison. There's a lot of neat things here. I mean, if you remove the people, it's a pretty great place. It feels to me like a school, meaning you go here to get perspective. Uh, I don't know if you've heard me use, you heard me use, use the, the genie reference. No, let's hear it. Okay. So the genie reference goes a little like, like this. Let's say you ran into a genie. You know, it gives you three wishes, but you're clever. So one of those wishes is more wishes. It's more wishes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, more wishes. So you ask for ah, a million wishes. Nobody ever makes it to a million, but that's a whole other story for another time. So you wish for everything you can think of. And by the way, you shouldn't ask for money right off the bat. Just to be sure, you should ask for immortality and, and you know superpowers and other, other crap. And you, you date everyone you ever wanted to date. You became a leader and a rock star and an athlete and whatever else you wanted to be. And it takes hundreds of years to do it, if not a couple thousand years. You become a king, whatever. Mm. Become the best surfer in the world. I don't really care. Because eventually what happens, and I do believe the universe kind of runs off this, is novelty. Eventually you run out of ideas. No matter how good you are, no matter how creative you are, eventually you run out of ideas, run out of wishes. And you go back to the genie, the genie looks at you and he goes, yeah, so how's it going? It's like, man, I am tapped out. I got nothing. I got nothing left. What, what can you do? Can you help me out? Can you help me out? It's like the genie says, well, there is one thing I could do for you. It's like, I can send you to this place. Short lifespan, 99.9% .9 conflict. All sorts of different ways to die. In fact, it's it's pretty miserable sometimes. It's really really awful. And uh, when you come back, though, you know you'll you'll have a brand new perspective. This place will be brand new, unlimited universe for you. It's mm -hmm. like wow, that sounds interesting. What's the catch? Now well, the catch is, you don't even get to remember this conversation. And he snaps his fingers Thanos style. Wow, you're here. Mm -hmm. And this is, I, I believe that the, the, the universe is cyclical and this world, and I'm not kidding you, it's one thing, you know, I've, I've stared at for a long time, which is this world is 99.9% .9 conflict. I mean, it doesn't matter how rich, how powerful, how beautiful, how talented you are. There's always something to complain about. Always. Doesn't, you know, rich people always worry about money. Ta you know, beautiful people stare in a mirror all day. Talent people think they're fraud and so on and so on, right? Well... If this world is 99.9% .9 conflict, then if you believe in dualism, and I do, that you can't appreciate one thing without another, you know, hot yeah. without cold, pleasure without pain, yeah, then whatever's outside of here is 99.9% .9 unlimited. But you can't appreciate it without going to a place like this. I like this. that. I love it. So yeah. a short time here, say 70 years, maybe 80, yeah, maybe you get lucky, go to 100. 5,000 years in the other place. And again, it's all voluntary. Meaning, you know, you get a chance. It's like, you know, you go to the genie and then you're like, wait a minute, I got like two or three more ideas. I'll see you in a while. And you go off and, and do your thing. But eventually you have to come back to a place like this. It recharges your batteries in a weird way. It gives you, it lets you know what you miss. You don't know what you had until you didn't have it. And that's what it feels like to me. I've never seen, I mean, despite what you think, what you may think about this world, don't envy anybody because everybody's got their own problems. And it's, it's all scales. 
Again, it doesn't matter if you're a billion, you know, even the, the biggest billionaire can't stay alive forever. It doesn't matter, by the way, Mr. Crowley, all those rituals didn't save him, right? Everybody had to deal with, you know, the process. And that's where I think we are. I think we're in, we're in basically a, a, a school that teaches perspective. I agree with like so much of that. And I talk about my views all the time. I tell people it's like, uh, it's very simple what you say. I say it's like uh, we're on God's green earth. We're surrounded by all these physical deceptions and everything. But this yeah. is like a learning process to graduate to the next side, which is, uh, you know, much more supernatural. And I, I lay it out like this. I, I you remember choose your own adventure books. It's like God's choose your own adventure book. And oh, people yeah, yeah, like us, we, we get to the end of a chapter and we make certain decisions. These other people, well, they're just going completely, completely with the script. And I personally think that yeah. they'll repeat until they eventually get to the point where they're ready to uh, graduate. I don't think anybody's if to hell if they're not NPCs, because they're we in any simulation, anyone we have ever built. NPCs are there, and don't forget. And let me end well, on a wanna, weird kind of... Well, let's elaborate. Can you elaborate on a little? Because I, yeah, yeah, I yeah, wanted yeah. to ask. Don't you. forget. I, I actually, the NP... while we were talking, I had typed that in my notes. I typed NPC, and I wanted to know what N your take NPCs, on which of course were were elaborated on quite a bit in in the Ryan and Reynolds movie Free Guy. Can which you add is, to um... a two? Can you add to a two like um, NPCs? Anybody, most people listening can say, "Oh, if we're in a simulation." I could see that, but even if we're not in a simulation, do you believe in NPCs and put that in? Oh yeah, 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 well? yeah. You you have to have them. NPCs don't people people again. I was there in the beginning. NPCs started out as just notes on the ground, <laughs> or, or something nailed to a tree, which yeah. was. You, you know, you needed someone to bounce things off of. It's like, okay, where do I go next? Oh, look, it's a note. It's like, you head through the dark forest towards the castle, right? And after a while, it's like, yeah, the note thing's getting kind of old. Can't we just put a person there? Yeah, okay, so we put a person there. It's a guy leaning next to a tree. And you come up to him, it's like, yeah, dark castle that way, right? And then after a while, he's not leaning next to the tree anymore. Now he's, he's wandering around the forest and you have to find him. And then after a while, you made it so advanced that sometimes he's not there. Sometimes he's at home. Sometimes he's, I mean, you, you want to take it to its, its logical end. This guy has got his own life, but he's got, there's nothing inside. He's just, uh, he's just a, a wind-up clock. That's all, that's all he's doing. Well, in any sort of thing we do now, there's virtually an army of NPCs. It doesn't matter what game you're playing. I mean, you know, the, the, especially in the MMOs, all the cities are just littered with those things. Littered with NPCs, you have to have them because you don't know how many real people are going to be in there. In fact, the whole thing is designed, the city works just fine. You don't even have to be there. The NPCs are walking around, do their own thing, get up, go to sleep, eat, all that fun stuff. So nobody, if you're going to do something like this, if you're going to come into a world like this, you're not going to, I, mean, I don't want to pick on any professions or anybody's life choices or anything like that, but you're not going to pick, you know, you've, you've seen these people, you've walked around, you've looked at them and you look in their eyes and you're going, yeah, he's walking and talking, but there's nothing happening up there. Yeah. He's just kind of reciting, he's reciting stuff. He's the, the, the old, um, what was it? I am legend. No, not I am legend. Um, I robot, um, movie with Will Smith, you know, responses, you know, sorry, my responses are limited. We don't do that anymore. You know, you, you throw enough flow charts in there, you can get it to where, you know, they get frustrated or walk away or whatever, but they'll never get stuck in that. So anyway, that's the NPCs. Do I believe in NPCs? Yes, I do. Do I think they're here with us? Yes, I do. Do I think there's a lot of them? Yeah, I do. Yeah, so no, that them, means, they're the ones. That means, that means you would have to consider that some of them could be your own family members then. Are you okay yes. with that? Yeah. Oh, hell yeah. It's necessary. You have to do it. Why? Why? And I know no one wants to think that it's like, well, no, all my family's absolutely real. Really? Why? 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 Just because you have, you know, you grew up with them, they have to be real. No, they don't. You can't be in their head. Why would they have to be real? Yeah. Technically, you might be the only one here. Yeah. Well, hey, man, I think it's <laughs> been a great show. I think people got a really lot out of this. Um, I, I think it's been one. I think it's been one of your best interviews, but I'm biased. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you uh, tell people if you have anything coming up that you want to talk about, tell them where to find you, any websites or anything. Uh, anybody that's on YouTube or Rockfin, I do have Mark's YouTube and Rockfin uh, linked in the show notes. But anything else you want to tell them, go ahead. And then I'll promote my upcoming shows and we'll get out of here, man. 
Sure. Oh, by the way, a real quick question in the chat. I, I know I've I've been kind of ignoring the 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 chat, but can can NPCs breed? Why not? Why wouldn't they? Why wouldn't they breed? Why that wouldn't be hard to do at all. We could write that. In fact, we could do we could do that in our thing in two seconds. Um, as far as finding me, uh, let's make it easy. Just type into Google Flat Earth Mark. That's it. You will you will find it. Yeah, you know if you try to type in flat earth clues or flat earth into YouTube, you're going to run into a, just a wall of other content that has nothing to do with me. Uh, the easiest way to just find me is type in flat earth mark, and uh, you'll you'll see my stuff. It's all over the place. Um, YouTube is I'm in YouTube, Bitchute, Brideon, Rockfin, Rumble, things I probably don't even know about because I don't put them there. And uh, yeah, as far as upcoming stuff, nah. I mean I do Strange World every Tuesdays. And just do interviews and answer questions and, you know, watching the world very closely right now and trying to see uh, where we're kind of going from, from here. Awesome. So I'll just tell people that uh, you've been watching My Awakening episode 75. Number 76 is coming right around the corner. I'll be interviewing Lucky Haskins same time on Wednesday, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific on all these platforms. I know uh, me and Mark have some very similar audience, but obviously this interview might get to people that normally don't see my stuff. So if you're looking for me, Brian S. Stavely, S-T-A-V-E-L-E-Y, on every platform. I stream everything on Rockfin. I put what I can on YouTube, and I upload everything to Odyssey. We're also streaming on Twitch now, Twitter, and Facebook. Or you can go to the Dose of Reality Show. Dot com and also after Wednesday Thursday night I'll be live with Karen B on all these channels unveiling this realm 8 30 Eastern and other than that I'm probably gonna have a patreon stream Saturday night with Christian and other guests but I'll let you guys know so Mark thank you so much brother and uh I could send you this file if you want a copy of the show or whatever and I'll yeah email it to yeah you. yeah I'd be happy to in fact um awesome. yeah yeah rip rip me the audio because that's what I usually do because then I can put okay. David Weiss slides over the top all right cool Awesome. Yeah. Well, hey, dude, thanks for coming on. It's uh, it's actually been a pretty long. It, this, the interview's been long overdue. We should have done this a while ago. I still got to get we Bob. Should've. I still got to get Jaron. I still got to get a few people. But uh, I just had David. Okay. I just had you. So I had a lot of fun, dude. I, I appreciate talking to you, and I, I like that you uh, you've looked at so many different things. It's cool stuff, man. Thanks hey, for thank what you, you do. Thank you.